Welcome to section two, basic concept. In this section, there are a number of lectures. The first lecture of which is the anatomy of a Go program. We'll look at what are the basic parts of a Go program you need that does something. So let's jump in and start coding. The first thing I'll need to do is open a terminal into which I can type commands. Once you have a terminal open, we need to change the directory containing our code or the directory in which we intend to save our code. Now that I'm in this directory, I can open Visual Studio Code to open the contents of this directory by saying code space dot. Once you have Visual Studio Code open, you'll notice that there are several files and subdirectories. Directories for each section, like section zero, section one, section two, and we're in section two now. And within each section, there's a directory for each lecture. Whereas lecture one is where we're going to be starting today. So we open lecture one. We're going to create a main that go file in this directory, which is going to contain the source code for our simple go application. To create a file, we click on the new file button, type main that go and press enter and we inside of the go file. Each go source file, like I said, belongs to a package, which means that when you create a file, you must say which package it belongs to. And so we do that by using the package keyword and giving the name of the package. It just so happened that because we're writing an application, we must have a package called main. That has nothing to do with the name that we chose to give to the file. We could have called the file file one, file x, or just f.go. It wouldn't matter. But here I chose to call it main.go to sort of signal to somebody who might review my code that this is sort of where you want to start. But the package name is important here. It's called main and that's required. And we'll see why later when we cover packages. The next thing I need is a function. This is called the entry point of our application. It sort of tell the go wrong time where to start executing programs. And so by using a package main, it tells the runtime to look in package main for the entry point function, which is also called main. These are just convention. You just have to accept and just keep repeating. So all of your go application will have a package main and also a function called main within that package. The main function cannot be in any other package. If the main function is in any other package, it is not considered the entry point. So just follow and do exactly as I do for now until you understand the purpose. So this is truly the minimal source code you can write to have a valid Go application. It's just that it wouldn't do anything. So let's use the print line function to print some text to the screen. And here we're going to print hello world. Now the print function that we're calling here, that's the name of the function and the argument we're giving it letters in quotes, that's a string. And we saying we want you to print this to the screen, but where's the print line function defined? Well, the print line function is in a package called FMT. And we haven't learned about packages yet, but remember, since every Go source file must belong to a package, it means that everything that you use will belong to some package or the other, either a package you've written or a package provided by someone else. So the FMT package is provided as part of the Go language. It's called a standard package. So we're going to import that FMT package before we can use it. So now our program is valid and we can go to the command line and run it. So we use the Go compiler to run our program. We can use it to run the program or we can use to compile the program or build it. And as you will see, when we change the directory, here we are with the source we have just written, we can say go run main and it compiles and run our program for us. We can also say go build in this directory and enter. And then if we do a listing, we'll see that we have an executable program, which we can then run or give to someone else who is on a Macintosh also. We can say go install and notice something seemed to happen. It removed the executable that we had, but if you look for it, it's in our bin directory, which is it puts it in that bin for binaries that I told you executable binaries. It put it placed it in that directory. We can of course make changes to our source code and recompile it. And we'll see how it will be updated if we then rebuild or do an install of our application, it will compile a new version, install it, and now we can run it. So let's restore our code now to hello world. One thing you want to do after when you write a lot of code is to leave comments in the code. Comments, a little bit of help and documentation 
for you or another human reader to understand what a code is supposed to be doing, especially when you write something complex. So I will put a comment at the top of our file and comments are for humans, like I said, and so they're completely ignored by the compiler. The compiler literally strips them out, throw them away, but it will still remain in your source code and it's valuable so that others or you, when you come back and look at your code, can see what you've done or you intended. And notice when we reinstall our application and rerun it, it runs the exact same way. You can use a comment pretty much anywhere in your source and you introduce a one line comment using double forward slash and it means that the comments start from the double forward slash to the end of the line. And again, compile and run and there's no problem. This is clear that this line prints hello world so I don't really need to document it. But if I had something more complex, I can choose to document it that way. There's another way to write comments and that is with a forward slash star and then you write your comment and you end the comment with another star forward slash. And that is when you want to write multiple lines of comment. Now let's review what we have learned so far. So we've written a simple Go program that looks like this and we've learned a number of things. One is a comment and we learned that a comment start with double forward slash for a single line comment. A multi line comment would be a forward slash star and then you end it with star forward slash. We've also learned that each source file must belong to a package. And in this case, we use the package keyword to see which package this source file belong to. We also learned that our, each program must have a package called main. And so since we, we are only writing a simple executable application here, we place our main.go source file in the package main. The other thing that's important is that we know that we have this special function called main also, which we introduce with the func keyword to say we're writing a function and the name of the function in this case was called main. And this special function is used as the entry point into our application. We also learned that you can import packages for use. And so we import the FMT package so we can use its print line function. And so we also see that on line seven, we have learned how to call a function by specifying which package it belongs to and passing a parameter to the function. So now that we finished reviewing some of the things we have learned in anatomy of a Go program, one final thing. In addition to the slides that are shown in the lecture, I may also provide additional slides which are not shown during the video lecture. And that is all for you to either review the material we have covered or to look at some other perspective on the things that we've covered. Thanks for your time. See you in the next video. It's time to review your exercise. Each section has a solution directory, which provides solution for all the exercises, the complete solution, and also a stub directory, which contain a stubbed out version of the code. So it might be things that just give you a hint. And as we get further and further along, there will be less and less code provided in the stock for you to get started, but the solution will always be complete. So what I'd like you to note is that the format of how the exercises are given. The exercise will have the word to do followed by a number. To do one here says change the program to print your full name. So I expect you then to modify line nine so that when the program runs, it shows your name. It says, hi, my name is whatever your name is. The next to do, to do two says to print out your country's name. So I expect you to add a line that prints your country's name. So those are the two things that you have to do for this exercise. Of course, if you can do the exercise or you just want to see the solution, check out the solution directory. But I advise you to try this because it's only by trying, then you get to see what you understand and what you don't understand before you look at the solution. And you might surprise yourself when you try it. Plus, this is how you learn. Hi, my name is Farrell Adams, and this is Golang for Tourist. Welcome back to lecture two and section two. And today we're gonna to be looking at Boolean and numeric values. Now, before we jump into some code, let's sort of get an understanding of what we mean when we say a value. So I'm gonna give you my definition. So I would say a value is an abstraction to represent a computed result. Now, know that out there are a number of values that are not computed. So some values just represent themselves. An example of that is what we call a literal. And literals are still values, it's just that they're not computed. So the number six, for example, 
is a value, but it's a literal value. Six stands for itself. It's not computed. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to add any two number or do some sort of arithmetic computation in order to get the value six. It just stands for itself. So we call six a literal. An expression, three plus one is an expression, and it computes to the value four. So you do get a value four, but three plus one itself is an expression. Of course, within that expression are literals. So three is a literal, it stands for itself. One is also a literal. 3.141592 is the approximate value of pi, and it too is also a value. It happens to be a floating point value. We have values like true or false, which are of type Boolean. Now, we haven't talked about types yet, but once you start collecting number of different types of values, or you have a different examples of values, you could see a difference between them and you start grouping them or categorizing them. So you could see like six, three, and one, they all sort of look alike in that they're whole numbers. They don't have any decimal places. Whereas the approximate value of pi, it has decimal places. And it's just the same thing with like currency, dollar amount, they have decimal places. And then something like true or false, also seems they're very different from any of the numeric values we have. And so those are different also. And so certain operations that are possible on one set of values are not possible on others. So it doesn't make sense to say, for example, what is true plus true? That doesn't make sense. But there are other operations that are valid for Boolean values. So true falls into the type Boolean. Let's start coding. So here I am in my Visual Studio Code Editor, and I'm in the directory section two, and I've created a directory for lecture zero two. So I'm gonna create a new file, and I'm gonna call it main.go. One of the first thing I wanna do, as I did in the previous example, is I wanna put a comment to represent just what we're doing in this file. And then of course, I'm gonna do the basic thing to get a very basic valid Go application. So what do we wanna do? So let's start off by printing out some Boolean values. And let's see how that shows up when we print it. So now we have two print statements and we're gonna print out true and false. And notice that these are values, predefined values in Go. So it knows what true is and it knows what false is. So let's run our program and see what we get. And as you can see, it prints out exactly like we would expect. There are three operations that are defined for Boolean values. You can take the not, which is the inverse of something. So you can say something that is not true or not false, or you can do and operations. So you can say, is this statement true and this out of statement false, or you can do or. So let's take a quick look. Okay, so now we've coded up some expressions using those operators I mentioned. So we have two examples of using not, we have an example of using the and operator, the Boolean and operator, an example using the Boolean OR operator. So let's run our program. And we can see that not of false is, like I said, the opposite or inverse, and so that's true. And not of true, of course, would equals to false. But a Boolean operator, well, it's a little bit harder to explain, but basically there's a table. I advise you to go look up the Boolean AND operator to see what are all the ways in which when you combine true and false, what the results would be. But basically the only time Boolean AND give you a true value is when both values that you're adding are, or both operands are true. The Boolean OR operator give you true when either one of the operands are true. And the only time you get false is if both are false. Let's get back to coding. Let's look at some more operators that would yield a Boolean value. So these are relational operators for integers, which we're gonna cover shortly, but they still yield a Boolean value. And let's see how that is. As you can see here, when we ask the computer, what is five greater than 10, it returns false. So even though we use numbers, we use a logical operation. So we wanna ask, is five greater than 10? And it tells us that oh, that is false. We also ask, is A, B, C, the string, equals to the string X, Y, Z, and also that's false. So in Go, you can compare numbers in your logical operators, and you can compare strings. So let's continue. Here we have a few examples. So we've introduced some expressions. We have had negative numbers. We're doing some arithmetic with negative numbers in different ways. And last example, we have a division, which is an integer division. The example in the last line might surprise you a little bit. So let's run it and let's see what we get. And so you can see all the others you probably expect and know what answer you should get, and that's consistent. But why is nine divided by 15 equals to zero? 
That's because we're doing integer division. So we're saying we want an old number divided by another old number, and therefore the answer we should expect to get is an old number, an integer. We'll see soon how we can fix that and get the answer that you might expect, which is a floating point number. And that means we'll have to do a floating point division. And of course, when we run our program, now notice when we do the floating point division, regardless of if we said 9.0 divided by 15, an integer, or 9 divided by 15.0, we still get the same answer. And the requirement there is so long as one of the numbers in our expression is a floating point number, then the result will be a floating point number. And this is important, as you'll see later on, when we get to variables and we need place to store our result. So remember here we have a value, right? And we might want to store it. And later on, we want to make sure it's always stored it in the right place. If we don't have the right type of variable, then we wouldn't be able to store a result. More about that on the, in the future video, but just sort of a heads up. Finally, let's look at complex numbers. So now I've written two examples of how you can write complex numbers. One, I have an explicit real, and I say plus imaginary number. Notice the imaginary part is written with an I immediately following the number. If I put a space, that's not correct. It doesn't know what that is. I have to put the I on the number, attach it to the number. Here, I have still have an imaginary number, but I do not have an explicit real part. So let's see how Go interprets these numbers and render them. And as you can see, Go put, prints them out with parentheses around them because it's saying, I know these things as an entity that belongs together. This is a not just 11 plus 4i, but really it's a complex number, which is its own entity. Put parentheses around it. Okay, so let's wrap up. So we know that though, you can type something like, right? So that does not work. So I'll make a note in there. I leave that example in there just so you know. Remember that in your supplemental reading material, I have references to additional reading assignment and additional materials that might help you with some of the things that I've covered. So please get in the habit of checking the supplemental material. Here's some reading material for you, for you to learn a little bit more about literals, logical operators, and so on. Take care, see you in the next lecture. Bye. Now it's time to look at your assignment. Scroll down to the stock folder, and we're gonna open exercise 02, and this is what I want you to do. I want you to complete this program. Here are your to-dos. I explained the to-dos before, and see if you can complete the exercise. Remember, if you can't complete it or you need some help, definitely take a look at the solution. So now let's take a look at your exercise for this lecture. You're gonna scroll down to the stop directory and click on exercise tree. And in this exercise, I want you to do something very simple. Just write a program that uses a raw string. Now, where do you get text for your raw string? You go to the Golang website and copy the text from the feature article. So here I am at the Golang website, and I'm going to scroll down to the bottom. And it says featured video and then feature article. And all I want you to do is copy the text from the featured article like this copy it, and then put it inside of your Go program. And of course, as you're gonna see, because you need to enclose probably single quotes and maybe there might be some double quotes and other formatting of the new line here and so on, hence why you'd wanna use a raw string. So just, that's just a tip. You can do it with uh, enclosing it in double quotes, but then you have to do string concatenation. And so that's all for your exercise. Welcome to lecture three, section two. And today we're gonna be talking about string and run values. In the previous lecture, we look at Boolean and numeric values, and of which we saw that all for numerics, there are three different types of numeric value. You had your whole number, your floating point number, and complex numbers. Now, we're gonna look at strings. And the only reason why we're gonna include runes here is because strings are made up of runes, and you'll see what I mean. But runes are a little bit weird because by themselves, they're actually numbers. Now, before we jump into the code, remember, get in the habit of checking out the supplemental material. I have additional slides where I try to illustrate what we're gonna be showing in code, which is how you break up a string and how those different parts of the string, each character that you can type and represent, gets represented in the computer by a number. So there's the printable character or code point and that gets represented by a number. If this doesn't make sense, don't worry, check out the supplemental material. I have some good reading material for you to help break this down. So let's jump into the code. 
As before, I'm going to start with a directory called lecture03, which is in our section02 directory. And I'm going to create a new file called main.go and write a minimalistic Go program before we can get started. So now that we have our basic main program, let's just write a string and have it printed to the screen. Actually, we wrote a string in our very first Go program when we had anatomy of a Go program. So let's see what it looked like. And there you have it. What we were doing is we we're passing a string, and the string here is hello, comma, world, bang, to the print line function. And of course, we know that if we run this, it's just going to print hello world. It wouldn't print the double quotes because we've seen this before. We can even test it, and we'll test it in a minute. But that, those double quotes there are used to delimit our string, which is to say where our string starts and where it ends. We can also use Unicode characters, and we can change world to be world in Chinese. So we'll mix English and Chinese characters. And now we can run our code, and we'll see that our Go is going to render this correctly. Now that we know what a string is, you can use double quotes to delimit it. You can enclose whatever you want essentially in a string. We'll see some exceptions just now. But for now, at least we, we know in theory how to make a string. Let's take a look at what a rune is. And a rune is a 32-bit number. And let me just show you, and then it'll make sense. So here I have a character. I have the letter H, and I've enclosed it in single quote. So what is different now? For one thing, this is a character. I cannot put more than one, except again, there's some exception. So I can't do this, for example, because that's not valid but I can enclose one character in single quotes and I can ask the computer print that for me. And let's see what we get. And yo and behold, I get a number. So what's going on here? When we use double quotes, we have a string. When we use a single quote, what we're saying is that we have a rune. And a rune is a 22-bit value that represents that character. So let's go back to our code. So here we have the character uppercase H and it's saying that the decimal number 72 represent is what you use to represent this character. So even though we type a printable character, it is just as if we have typed the number just 72. And to prove to you that oh, this is really a number, we can do some addition with it. We can say, for example, add 20 to it. And notice I do not get any red squiggly lines because that is really just a number. All right. So enough about this. Let's just stick to looking at runes. And so let's print out what the numeric value or the rune values are for all the other characters in our hello world using the Chinese characters. Okay, so now we have broken up our string and enclosed each character in our hello world, with world being in Chinese, characters in single quotes. And now we're going to print it out. And what we should expect, again, numeric value for each one of these. And there we go. Now, we can do other things. We can say, for example, can you print the corresponding character if I were to give you the numeric value? So what would that look like? We can use the printf function from the FMT package. So now what I'm saying here is use printf where I can specify how I want things to be printed out. And I'm saying I'm giving you a number, which is 19,990. And I want you to print that as a character. Notice the percent %c. And then I'm saying, OK, also use the same number and print it out as a decimal, which is exactly what it is, right, an integer. And then here I'm saying print the same number as an hexadecimal. So let's run our program and see what we get. And look what happens. When we tell FMT printf to print our number as a character, it rendered the character representation for that number. Of course, when we say print it as a number, well, we just get the number. And then when we say print it in hexadecimal format, we also get a number, but it's a number in a different numbering system. Let's talk now about escape characters. Notice the number I have between. So I'm saying print a string followed by the number 10, followed by another string. The result when I run this program should not be surprising. So let's run it. OK, so I get exactly what I said I wanted printed out. So why did I put a 10 in between hello, comma, and world? Well, if you remember what we were doing just now, we said that all, that all characters get represented by a number. So there is a corresponding character for the number 10. And let's see what that character is. So here I've typed a character. You know I've typed a character because you see me use single quotes. But notice I have two individual characters within there. I have the backslash character and I have the end character, each one of which I could in theory type by itself. But again, exceptions. So I can say this or I can say this. So when I do this, end stands for itself. But when I do this, 
is called an escape character, which means I'm given N a special meaning. And you see me use that up here also when I wanted to add a new line, but you didn't know what it was for. Now you can see that I've typed this as a character by itself. So let's run this program and see what is the value of this backslash N character, which is a call a escape character. And the value is 10. So now you see why I use 10 here because I wanted a new line between here. But of course, if I type the number, I don't get that. If I actually wanted to print as a new line character, I have two ways of doing it. So one way is to simply do a string with an embedded new line character. And so now I've embed the new line character within my string. And now I'll get the result, which is hello comma space on one line. And on a new line, I'll get world. So let's run it and see. And there we go. That's exactly what I want, and that's what a new line corrector gives me. So keep in mind, when you use a corrector by itself, it's a number, but if you embed it in a string, then the corrector gets rendered, okay? The representation for that corrector. In this case, we do not actually see a backslash N on the screen because it's a special corrector called an escape corrector. Let's see, there's some other escape correctors. So the last two examples, since we're using the backslash to be able to escape other character, give special meaning to other characters, we couldn't possibly use the backslash by itself because a backslash by itself in a single quote would sort of try to escape the single quote. And so in that case, we have to use two backslashes if we want a backslash. And of course, if we want to print that out, we don't want a number, but the backslash itself, we have to use it in a string. Similarly, with single quotes, since we're using a double quote to delimit our string, we couldn't simply just use a double quote within a string because then it would look like the end of a string prematurely. So we'll have to escape it within a string by using a backslash. So let's run our program and see what we get. And we can see that the numeric value for a backslash is 92, but of course to get a backslash, we have to escape it. And the numeric value for a double quote is 34. So okay, so you might be asking yourself, where would I find out what the numbers are for different characters without me having to type a character and then run my program to see what the numbers are? Well, just so happened, there's a handy website called ASCIItable.com. And if you go there and you type this in your web browser, you will find the chart for the English ASCII characters. And you can see here that we have the decimal number, the hexadecimal number, octal number, which is yet another number in system, and then the character and their meaning. So some of these you don't really care about because those are for telephone and um, basically modems. But if you look at the one for new line, you see new line line feed, this is 10, which we were using the decimal number. But you could sort of go down the list and you can see the different characters. And notice everything you can type on your keyboard is here and even some things you can't type. And where is our 72? We're using 72 and that was capital H. And we saw 34 just now, representing a double quote, so 34, and there it is. And backslash, if we look for backslash, there it is, 92. This is not all. 0 through 127 is not all the possible characters. We also had the Chinese characters. And if you look at the extended ASCII table, well, they just go to 255 possible characters, to the number 255, from 0 to 255, which just gives you a total of 256 possible characters. So where are the Unicode characters? They're here. So you click on Unicode, and then for example, we were looking at the Chinese-Japanese simplified ideograph. So unified ideograph, if you click here, and if you zoom in and scroll down, you can see the hexadecimal value. So one of our characters was 4E16, and if you scroll down in this table and you look for it, 4E16, here it is. This is where you get all those numeric values. Now that you see where the characters are, well, let's go back to our code because there's one other type of string that I want to cover and it's called a raw string. Notice this very long string I've typed and I've included double quotes within it. That's because we're not using double quotes to delimit our string anymore. Now we're using a back tick. And that is the character, depending if you're on a Western keyboard, it's the one preceding your numeric one key. And that allows us to enclose a number of things within the string, anything virtually, and have it print out literally. That's why it's called a raw string because none of the characters within it get interpreted. So let's run our program and see what we get. And of course, because it's taken literally how we've typed it with all the tabs and everything and the new line because it doesn't encode it or do anything special with it, 
then it prints it literally like that. So we can clean this up a little bit. And now that looks a little better. But notice because we type it on multiple lines, those lines are there. So you want to use a raw string where you want to be able to encode the new lines that you're typing, encode double quotes and so on. Notice I didn't have to escape them. I literally typed the double quotes and they show up. Well, there's still another way we can type long strings, but we have to add them together. So this is called string concatenation. So let me show you what that looks like. Now notice, since I'm using double quotes to enclose my string here to delimit my string, if I wanted to enclose a double quote, I had to escape it. Now what if I wanted to continue typing even more, a much longer string? So at this point, my string is sort of going past the screen and I might want to put it on multiple lines. So you might think that, oh, I can do something like this. I can just cut my string like this. Well, that is not valid. And the only way we can do this is by concatenated by saying, this is one string and I want to use the plus operator to add it to another string. So I can type two strings and they can be in separate lines, but between them, I must use a plus operator. Not only that, the plus operator must be at the end of the first string. What I mean by that is, for example, if I want to add more to this, and so you might think that I can do this. This also wouldn't work. So I have to put the plus at the end of the previous string. And now I have a valid long string, but notice I had to take care of making sure that I use a plus operator. And if I use embedded quotes, I have to embed them. So now we could run this and we can get slightly different result. Let's see. Notice here, I do not have my new lines in this string because all I've done is concatenated individual string to make a much longer string. I do not have a raw string. So keep those two things in mind. Okay, so that's it for strings and runes. Take care, see you in the next lecture. Bye. Welcome to lecture four, section two. And in this lecture, we'll be talking about constants and variables. Specifically, we'll look at how you declare constants and variables and how you use them. But before we jump into the code, let's just go over some concept first. So first concept is everything inside of a computer is represented by a number. Regardless of what you've ever seen on a computer anywhere or what you've ever done on a computer, somewhere in memory, that is just a set of numbers. That includes video, a document, a picture. And as we saw in the previous lecture, even strings are represented as numbers. But how are numbers represented really? And numbers are broken down into bits. But this is the lowest entity that a computer really deals with are bits. And bits can store a value of zero or one. Because a bit can only store a value of zero or one, you can think of it like a switch, wherein a switch can either be on or off. And because there are only two possible values, zero or one, we refer to that as a binary value. Here's an example. So if I have a switch, I can turn my light off, I can turn it on and off again. But regardless of what I do, I can only go between those two states, zero and one, or on and off. So when it comes to counting with bits, what we really like to do is use the fact that if you group multiple bits together, you might be able to count higher and higher numbers. So with a value with one bit, we know that we can represent two distinct states or two different values. With two bits, we can represent four states. And the way we do that is if we take, again, the idea of two light bulbs, now we can see that they can be in four different states when combined. So if we're going to be grouping bits together, we need some numbering system to tell us the rules for going between different numbering system. So when we use in bits, we call that binary number system. When we use in decimal number, and decimal means 10, which means zero to nine digits. And there's also hexadecimal, which we saw in the previous lecture, when we talk about the Chinese character, we saw that the number 19,990 was represented as the hexadecimal 4E16, if I remember correctly. We can certainly use any numbering system we want. It's just that some numbering system makes it very easy for us to be able to write and read a value quickly. So if we look at the first row there, we see it so we have four bits, and when they're all zero, it represents the value zero. As we move down the left side of the table, we can see that by the time we get to representing the number seven, we have to remember that it's zero, one, one, one. 
And that's not as easy to remember, certainly not as fast to write as just writing seven. When we get to the write table, all the way to the bottom, we see that in binary, the number 15 in decimal, where you just write two digits, one and five, you'd have to write four digits, one, 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 one. But in hexadecimal, you can write 15 by simply writing F. So if you don't know anything about numbering system, don't worry. We talk a lot about numbering system in Golang for Adventurers, the follow-up course to Golang for Tourists. Or you can go online and do some reading on numbering system. Now let's talk a little bit more about grouping bits. Once we talk about grouping bits to represent number, we want to give those set of bits a name. So four bits we call it a nibble, eight bits we call a byte, and you might hear bytes being used often because we use bytes as the unit for describing memory capacity or hard drive capacity. So we might say, so you have a two terabyte hard disk, or you have eight gigabytes of memory. So bytes is when is used to represent or as the unit of measurement. We can also use 16 bits, 32 bit, 64 bit, and you see a pattern here is keep doubling. And most of your computers today, at least in the year 2018, use 64 bits for addressing. There's also 128 bits for storage and even some computers use it for addressing. So far, we've talked about values in our previous videos. We talked about Boolean values, numeric values, and then string values. So what is data? I'm going to be using the word data and value interchangeably. And when we looked at values in our previous videos, we noticed that though they fall in several categories. I just mentioned them. They were values that look the same and use the same operations, for example. So Boolean values use the same not or and or or operation, but you didn't have those operations defined for integer values. So I would say that a data type defines the interpretation and representation of a value, such as, for example, integer floating and Boolean, we know that those are interpreted a certain way and they have a certain representation that define them as integer floats and Boolean. The other thing that a data type does is it defines the valid set of operations. So not only does the data type say how you can represent them, but it also say what you can do with them. Once we're dealing with groups of bits to represent numbers, because everything inside a computer is a number, regardless of whether it's being used to represent a Boolean or a string, and even Booleans are going to be represented by a number, even though we say that the valid values for a Boolean is just true and false, that's just how we represent it visually. But within the computer, remember, everything is a number. We just don't really care right now how Booleans are represented numerically. We just care that in representation, we type true and false. But since everything in the computer is a number, we have to talk about signed versus unsigned. And what we mean here is if we look on the left hand side, and we said that we're using three bits to represent numbers, we can see that we can represent eight possible numbers. And if we start counting from zero, that takes us from zero through seven. However, zero through seven just represent positive numbers. What if we wanted to do negative numbers using the same three bits? Well, on the right hand side, we have another table and we can see that we can only represent half as many positive numbers, specifically zero through three. Once we want to represent negative numbers, we use the leftmost bits of our three bit numbering system we use the leftmost bit to tell us whether we're dealing with a positive number or a negative number. And the way we encode that value to represent negative is something called two's complement. I'll go back and revisit the idea of two's complement in a little bit. So just keep this in mind that when we have unsigned, we can represent only positive numbers. And when we have signed, we can represent both positive and negative numbers. And given the same set of bits, a sign value that will allow you to do negative have its range half because it has to share it with the negative numbers. So some of the basic types in Go, as we have said before, are Boolean, which we know are true and false values. We also have string data type, of which we won't worry about the representation of that either. And then we have our numeric types. When it comes to our numeric types, we have integers. And now we know about grouping bits to form different sets of values. We can say that we have 8-bit integers. So these are really small integers. And these are the smallest we can get in terms of integers. We have 16-bit integers. We have 32-bit integers and 64-bit integers. When it comes to floating point types, numeric types, we have 32 bits floating point numbers and 64-bit floating point numbers. Finally, we come to our complex numbers. And those are 
complex 64 bits and complex 128 bits. And the difference there is basically which size of float do we just we use for our real and imaginary part. So if we use 32-bit floats for a real and imaginary part, then we have a 64-bit complex numbers. Whereas if we use a float 64-bit for our real and imaginary part, then we have a complex 128-bit. So just before we finish with our slides, these are the different type and name that Go provides for your numeric types of different sizes. As you can see at the top, we have the unsigned ints, which are 8, 16, 32, and 64, and the appropriate value range. If you're doing something like age, you certainly want to use something like a U int 8 because you're starting from zero, you can store a value from zero up to 255. Now, somebody might say, well, why don't I use int 8 for my age? I can certainly get to 127, and not too many people are older than 127, but then I'll counter with nobody's going to be a negative age, so why would you want to take the chance that maybe somebody would enter an invalid value? So I would not recommend that. And your exercise is along this line where I give you a description of an identifier, and I ask you to determine what is the appropriate type for it, using one of these numeric types or a string or whatever, and also whether it's going to be a variable or a constant. We're going to see how to declare variables and constants next. Let's now jump into the code. Here you can see I'm in my Visual Studio Code Editor. I've created a main.go file in my directory lecture04, which is a subdirectory of section02. So let me pretend that I wanted to use the value of pi several places in my program. And so if you notice that my value for pi is different in the two places. Now I did this on purpose here, but what I want to illustrate is when you're coding, sometimes if you keep typing the same value over and over, especially if you intend for them to be the same, you can make a mistake or someone else can make a mistake. And so while these are close enough for me to be able to see the mistake, sometimes they might be in different files and so on. So, so I don't really mean to have this to be a string anyway. I want this to be a floating point number. So it's best to introduce a name to represent that value. So I can do that by creating a constant because I do not expect the value of pi that I want to use to change throughout my program. And now I don't have to worry about the value of pi having a different, being different throughout my program or making a mistake because it's just easier for me to say, I just want to use pi knowing that the value associated with a constant pi will be substituted in place wherever I want. So this is how easy it is to declare a constant and use it. Just simply use the constant name in place of the value wherever that might be. But maybe I have another function where I would like to use the same constant pi. So let's ignore for a second that we haven't covered how to declare functions, even though we've been declaring the main function for a very long time and been using it. But notice how my foo function looks exactly like my main function, except for the name foo. But I have a red squiggly under the word pi there because if I hover my mouse over it, it's going to tell me how it's undeclared. It does not know about this identifier I want to use. And that's because pi is only valid within the scope or the definition of this function main, which is between those two curly braces. So I can use pi anywhere I want in main because I've declared it in main. So if I want pi to be usable outside of main in any other function, I have to put it outside of main. So if I move it up here, I've essentially moved it to the package level, and we haven't covered packages yet, but basically any other function within my package main can use this constant pi that I have defined. And notice now the error went away. Now I can declare other constants too. They don't have to be floating point constants. So notice I have declared a few more constants, and I don't have any wriggly or warning in my program because once you declare a constant, even if you don't use it, it's not a problem. What I want to show you now is the default type that Go has selected for our constants. Here I'm using the printf function from the FMT package. And I've put a link to the FMT package documentation so you can read up on the printf function and other function in the FMT package. So what I'm doing is I'm saying print the value of pi and I want you to print the type of this value. And so if I run it, we see that the type for pi is 
Float64. I did not have to tell Golang to use Float64. That is the, the default type it is using for this floating point value. So let's see what is the default type it is picked for age limit, default country, and so on. Even though we suspect that default country should be a string, and of course this should be a Boolean, and this, based on our previous discussion about characters, this should be an integer, a rune, which is a 32-bit value. But let's see. And just as we suspect, age limit, an integer, it shows an int for it, and string, and boolean, and of course, our character, it shows integer 32, which means it's a 32-bit value. And as we saw from the previous chart, I don't know if you caught it, but at the bottom, it says that rune is just an alias for int 32. Byte was an alias for u int 8. But like I said before, if you're using something like age, we do not need to use an integer value, which could be either 32 bits or 64 bits, depending on the platform you're on. We want this to be something more like a u int 8. So we can override the type that goes uses. And now when we run our program, we see that oh, it's using u int 8 instead. What we have now is an example of a typed constant and the others are on type, which means that we did not specify a type, even though we know that oh, they have the correct type, or at least the type we're okay with for now, they're still considered on type. So this is an on type float, as you can see that there, and this is an on type string constant. But it is a string, but it's on typed. Whereas here, we know the type is uint8. There's one other thing we can do with constants. So instead of keep typing the keyword const const all the time, we can put this in parentheses and don't have to keep typing const all the time. And that saves us some typing. And it's just as we use import here, we can definitely specify multiple imports and don't need to, to use the import keyword for each line, just so long as they're in separate lines. So now let's look at declaring and using variables. Here we've declared a variable a, and we said its type is bool. We haven't given it a value. We simply printed it out. But since it's a variable, we can change the value. Versus a constant, we cannot change a value once it's declared. So we again print out a value. So let's, we should expect to see the default value for a Boolean if you don't set it. And then we can see if we were able to override it. And we can see the default value for a Boolean is a false, and we were able to change that to true. Here we see another example of how you can declare a variable by using what is called a short declaration. The short declaration simply means you drop the var keyword and use colon equal and a value. So you would use the short declaration once you want to declare, create a new variable and assign it a value. And if the default type that Go is going to use is what you want. You cannot specify a type when you use a short declaration. You can only specify a type when you use this longer form. And you can also assign a value as we'll see next. These two examples show that oh, not only can we assign a value while we're declaring a variable, but we can also create multiple value. So here, we created a variable t and u and assign them values. We can also create variables with different type. And we can see s is a string, but it's not being used, hence we have a Wrigley because we are not using our s. So when you create variables, you must use them in the function. Another thing with short declaration is that you can only use them within a function. So for example, I cannot put a short declaration here. I cannot say w, for example, is equals to 20. This is illegal. 
However, I can put variables here that I want to use across multiple functions, just like I would if I wanted to define a constant that I would use across multiple functions. Once my variables are declared at the package scope or outside of a function, I do not get an error about it not being used. But if I declare a variable inside a function and I don't use it, then I get an error. No surprise, we can do this for any type. So here we know this is going to be a float and we can do operations with that float, also storing the result back into another variable. And since this is float and we add a number to it, a whole number, well, we just expect to get back a float and we can print that out. We can cast our result or computation or, or the result of our expression to an integer, store that in E and E will be an int, which we can run and verify. But there's one thing that might cause you a problem. Let's say we want to cast our constant pi to an integer. When we try this, we get this red squiggly. We put a mouse over it. It says cannot convert pi, which is an untype float. Remember I told you about type and untype constants. It's an untype float constant. We cannot convert it to an int. However, if we assign pi to a variable and we try to convert it, it works. No problem. Well, even stranger, look at this. Now we have another constant we call pi2, which is just 3.0. And when we convert that to an int, we don't have an error. This works just as expected. So what is going on? Well, it turns out that if your constant floating point number contains anything other than a decimal zero, then you will get an error. So for example, if I put like one here, I'll see that this conversion will give me a problem. And that is because here it's an approximation and it cannot convert that constant to an integer. But when it's a variable, well, it just truncates it. There's one final thing about constants and you should read the Golang specification to get a better understanding of this. But basically, Go allow you to write very large constant numeric values. And the reason why is it doesn't need to print them until you use them. And so, for example, I can write a const huge value here. And let me just copy this rather large constant value. Go is not going to complain about the size of this constant. This is a very big number. I can run my program since I'm not using it. But when I'm ready to use it, like if I try to put it in a variable, for example, now I get an error that tells me that it's overflowed this unsigned in 64. And we know this is the largest possible integer, even though when I put my mouse over huge, it's telling me it's an integer. So this is an integer, but yet I cannot store this on unsigned int or even an int, the same type that it's saying this huge is. So here I see const huge is an int, but still, I cannot store it in an int called z. That's because Go allows you to write arbitrary size constants, but only until you're ready to use them. Then it says, oh, I have to represent this now. So can I put it in a type? And the answer is no, this is too big. But it allows me to do operations with this very large number that I cannot represent or I cannot store. So here you can see that I can store this at least I can do computation with it and it stores it in a variable. It might be possible for me to store it in a float. And so that's not a problem. So that's pretty much it for constants and variables. As we go through the course, we're going to learn a little bit more. For now, just keep in mind that use a constant if you have a value that you don't intend to change throughout the life of your program. When using variable, use the appropriate size. Do not waste space. So if you only need eight bits to represent a value or any possible value which in true to the life of your program, do not use a 16-bit or 32-bit or a 64-bit. Take care. See you in the next video. So let's take a look at your exercise. Your exercise for this lecture is to write a complete Go program and determine which one of these should be a constant, a variable, and also when you need to overwrite the type 
because maybe Go will choose a type that wastes space. And we're trying to say that if you know that all your values that you're going to store either in, in that variable is never going to go beyond a certain limit, maybe you can use a more appropriate type. So keep that in mind. And remember that oh, not everything, there's a single right answer. Some of them, it can based on your interpretation of how these identifiers are going to be used. So maybe you might choose a variable for some that should be a constant, vice versa. Regardless, give it your best shot and look at the solution if you want to see how I thought about it. Let's take a look now at your exercise for this lecture. For your exercise, you're going to print out different messages depending on a user age. Now the get user function, which you do not need to look at the implementation, returns a user age. And every time you run the program, it returns a different age. So all your program needs to do is use this value that's in user age to print out whether the user is too young to sign up to our application, whether they should come back in a year when they're 18, or whether they're old enough. That's all you have to do. So you just simply have to replace this line with your if statement for that. And the other thing you should do is run the program a few times so you can get the idea that it is going to those different conditions. Because like I said, every time you run the program, you should get a different user age, which you will see printed out here when it says how old you are. Welcome to lecture five in section two. In this section, we're going to be looking at the if statement. Well, let's think about how we've been writing programs so far. So far, our program have a definite beginning. We start off with a statement, we do something, and then we execute one or more statement, and our program ends. So if you think about it, that's sort of like a straight line. So the flow of our program is a simple straight line. But what if we wanted to do more than that? So instead of doing just a straight line or having a flow that's a straight line, we want to execute one or more statement, then test a condition or do a check to see if something is true or false. And if it's true, we execute one or more statement, if it's true. And then if it's false, we can optionally execute some other statements, one or more statements. So what that gives us is the ability to do things like this. We can skip the execution of statements. So we can start our program, statement one, and then we test the condition. And if it's true, we can decide to execute statement two. Or if it's false, we can decide to execute statement two. But in any, if the condition is not what we want, that's the important thing here. If the conditions are not correct for us to execute statement two, then we just proceed through the other statements and then our program ends. And going back to the general case, which we just saw in the beginning, is basically being able to say, I can take one or two paths through my program, depending on the condition. And so an example of this might be, if it's Monday, I'll say, hello, welcome to the start of the week. And if it's not Monday, I'll go, oh, you still have a few more days to go, something like that, right? So this is what the if statement allow you to have in your program. So let's jump in the code and take a look. As usual, I'm starting here with main.go in a subdirectory called lecture05. I have a simple main go application ready. So let's start writing some code. So we're going to start out by looking at the simple if statement. And how do you write an if statement? Well, it's the if keyword followed by a condition. And the condition is a Boolean expression or variable that contains a Boolean value. And then the body of the if statement with all the other statements you want to execute. So let's write it. What you're seeing is a error because it does not know what condition is. This is a placeholder for me right now. All I'm saying is your condition, whatever it is that you put here, must be a Boolean expression or variable that it evaluates the Boolean value. So we can use the through value, for example. And now my error goes away. So I'm saying if true, and this is always going to be true, it's never going to change because I'm just using a literal value. And so we can run this program. And no surprise there, this is what we expect. What might make more sense is if we were to put this in a variable or some constant, whereby every time we compile our program, we might want to change it.
And this way, now I can decide when I want login enabled for my application when I compile it. Now, if I need to login to be changed during runtime, I might make this a variable instead. And then I read it from somewhere from the user or some other file or something. But in this example, let's say that login is a constant. And my program prints nothing because this evaluates to false. So there's nothing to do. Here's another example. I've created a variable x using the short variable declaration. And now I'm going to test. I ask the question, is x greater than 10? Now we know that our x is not greater than 10. So that expression or my condition here evaluates to false. So what I should expect is the output that tells me that our x greater than 10 is false. And that's exactly what we get. Now, notice that I use a variable that is an integer. And even though I had two integers, because I'm using relational operators, the result of relational operators are Boolean values. So if this doesn't make sense to you, please review the section on numbers. I have a reference there to logical and relational operators. So let's look at this example. What I'm doing here is the if statement allow you to have two statements. Basically, you can do a short declaration. It must be a short declaration. So you cannot say, for example, var x equals to four. That is not allowed. It must be a short declaration like this. And so you can have a short declaration and then the condition. And now it makes this a little bit compact. But the important thing to note now is that this x variable is very different than the x variable that I declare in my function main. So now I have two x variables. And we're going to test later that we did not change the value of our x in main by simply printing out And if we had changed our x in main to 4, for example, well, then this output here shouldn't be 4 and not 5. The other thing is we know that you cannot declare a variable if it's already declared in the same scope. But we can do it here because the if statement introduces its own scope. What is its own scope? Between here, it's saying I want this other x variable for this place only between these lines, between these curly braces, just as when we declare this variable x here, it's from this line down until the end of the main function. When I use x, if I were to print out the value of x, it would be 4 because the x here, it masks, it hides the x in our main. Okay, so there's no way to get to our x in our main. But let's run this and see. As you can see here, we know that our x is different than it's 4 because we would not have been able to get this print out, right? Because our logical operation says, only if x is less than 5, then do this. So if it was using the x where x is equals to 5, then we would not be able to get into this part of it. And also, you can see when we print out here, we we're able to get 5, saying that we did not change our previous 5. Sometimes when you want to use a variable for if statement, maybe you might want to do a short declaration. When we learn about functions, you can also call a function to initialize the variable that you're going to use. So here's an example. Here, I'm overriding our variable that we already have declared in main, and I'm setting it equals to 4. So in this case, if I run this program now, we should definitely expect to get this output. So let's run it and see. And we see x is less than 5. That makes sense. Now, if I uncomment it, we know that our x is going to have the value of 5 because that was what it was set to when it was declared. So I should expect to have this output. And now if I set x to something greater than 10, for example, it should tell me that our x is greater than 10. And notice this is a multi-if statement. Only if that fails, then try another if statement. And I could keep putting as many of these elf if as I would like. And eventually I said, if all of these tests fail, then execute the else statement. So this is yet another way in which you can take even more than two paths. You can take several other paths. Besides doing logical operation with numbers, we can also do tests with strings. 
So for strings, we have the concatenate operator that's defined for string. We also have the equal equal operator, and we also have the not equal, less than, and greater than operators defined for strings. And what does it mean to ask if a string is, well, it's probably clear enough to say if one string is not equal to another string, or if one string is equal to another string, which means ex check for exactness. But what about if two strings are less than equal? So let's take a look. And to remember, when we use characters, we're really just specifying the numbers here. So even when we use strings, it's the same thing because all Go is going to check each character of each string and see whether or not they meet the condition we're asking about, whether that character is less numerically than the other character or greater than so on. And as you can see, we have the case where A is less than B, which is as we expect. If you think of the letter in the order in which you would arrange them, if you're trying to try to order names, for example, then this is important to be able to test whether strings are less than or equals to each other. And it doesn't really matter whether if I'm testing a character alone, then sure. But if I'm testing a string, I can certainly do the same less than equal test. So that's it for if statement. Just remember that you can use a short declaration before your condition, and your condition must evaluate if it's an expression to a Boolean value or be a variable that contains a Boolean value. Remember to check the supplemental material for additional slides, a review on this lecture, in addition to reading material on the if statement in the Go language specification. Take care. Thanks. See you in the next lecture. So let's go through your exercise for this lecture. So in this exercise, it's very similar to your previous exercise. In your previous exercise, we use if statement to print out appropriate messages depending on the user age. Again, I don't need you to look at the implementation of the get user age function. So far, you've been using the print line function, and you had no need to look at it. So you don't need to look and see how get user age work. Just know that it returns a user age. And what I want you to be able to do is use a switch statement instead of a multi-condition if statement. And that's it. So just convert your last exercise, if you did it, to this, or you can look at the solution. Welcome to lecture six in section two. And today we're going to be talking about a switch statement. The switch statement is very similar to your if statement. And because of that, it is best to just show you how similar they are in code. So let's jump in. So here I am in my Visual Studio Code editor. I want to start by reviewing what we know of the if statement. So I'm going to start with an if else statement. And if you remember from our previous lecture, we had something that looked like this. So we had this code, something that looked like this. We initialize x in main the previous time, but I'm doing it here as a short declaration. I can change it. So we know that though x is 5, so we should expect this printout. So let's run the code. And of course, we can change it. We can say x is 4, for example. And we can, of course, make x something like 11. OK, work is the same. Well, let's just add another case or another condition to our if statement here. So we've added one other condition and nothing much has changed. We, we can keep adding as many of these else if as we like. And I don't have to run this, it's gonna work. What I would like to introduce to you now is another way in which we could write the exact same set of condition, but using a switch statement instead of if else. The first thing I'm going to do is copy our existing code and change it to a switch statement. So let's do it. Okay, so what happened? Well, Besides replacing the 
if with switch, we still have our short declaration. But here, we require to have a semicolon. That is because we expect a condition to come here, but we don't have a condition. So we need to say that, oh, well, the condition is empty because we're going to test each condition with these cases. So instead of saying if else, if else, we can just replace those with case. And we end each case with a colon. And all the statements that you want to apply to that case, you simply put them here below the case. And Golang is smart enough to know that anything that applies to this case ends before you start another case. So it's the same exact result. Here, we're going to only execute the statement for each case and nothing else. If the case x is less than 5 is true, then we execute this statement. Otherwise, it goes and it checks this statement and this case and so on. This is exactly like our if else statement. They give you the same result. They just look slightly different. Which one you want to use is up to you. In general, programmers tend to use a case statement when they have too many if else conditions, but otherwise they function the same way and you can use either. So let's run our program. Notice our output. This also proves that like the if statement, the switch statement introduces its own scope, which means this new variable x is only valid within the scope of the switch statement and not outside of it. Note that our switch statement has this default clause, which is optional, just as the else clause is optional for our if statement. Like our if, we can also use strings in our switch statement. All it is, is each time you run the program, different day of the week, as a string, and now I want to test it and print out different messages depending on which day it is. So let's assume that I have a function called getDay, and I can store the day in this variable called day. So now we've written some code. Let's try and go over it and review. So I have a switch statement, and I'm going to use a short declaration to initialize my variable day. Then I'm going to switch on day. So this you've never seen this before, but it really doesn't matter if I pull this out. The only advantage to doing it this way is that now we, day is a local variable that goes away after my switch statement ends. I do not want to use it any other place. If I want to use day somewhere else after the switch statement ends, then I will pull it out and put it as a variable that's declared in main. So I can do it this way. And now I'm switching on day. Okay, and what this means is take day and compare it to each of these values in each of my case statement. So let's put it back the other way because we don't really want day anywhere else. And so what we're saying is in the case where day has the value Monday, then I want you to execute this statement. If day, the value of day is Tuesday or Wednesday, either one of those two values, then I want you to execute this statement. Notice this flexibility and the compactness of a case statement. Hence, why when, once you find yourself having too many if else condition tests, you might want to go and switch that to a switch statement. No pun intended. If the value of day is Thursday, I want to print this out. If the value of day is Friday, then print this out. Notice something also with Saturday. If the that value of day is Saturday, I want you to print this but I want you to fall through, which means continue through to the next case and print out this also. So when we run it, if we get a day of Saturday, we should expect two statements, this and this. If the day is Sunday, well, we only get one statement because Sunday does not have a fall through. And note, we can still have a default because at this point, there's something wrong with my code. If I get a day value for day that is not one of these. So let me paste that implementation in. And again, I don't want you to focus on it. This is not part of your what you need to know right now. I'm just putting that there so we can able to do this contrive test to illustrate how switch statement works. So let's run our program. And so we got Sunday and it's just as we expected, we have this one statement. Let's run it again. And here, this time we got Saturday, as you can see. And like I said, we have the two statement because we fell through. And it just so happened that I got Sunday and Saturday right next to each other that I can show you. 
that in the first case when we had Sunday, we had this only, which is from the same print statement. Let's run again. And here is Tuesday, Thursday, Wednesday. And notice Tuesday and Wednesday use the exact same printout. So hopefully that is sort of clear how to use the switch statement, how it compares to the if statement with multiple conditions, and maybe the capability of using something like this, where you can specify multiple things to test. And remember, this works for numbers or strings, might help simplify things for you. Now, I have to warn you about the fall through. Be careful about using fall through. I've seen very few code that's well written that needs to use a fall through. So while the capability is there and the feature is there for the switch statement, be careful about how you use it. Take care. See you in the next lecture. Let's take a look at your assignment for this lecture. So what is your exercise for today? Well, the first thing to note is that I'm asking you to ensure that your solution, one of your solution, include the use of the continue keyword. With that in mind, what is it that you're supposed to do? Well, to do one says calculate the sum of all odd numbers between 1 and 10,001 inclusive. So that would be the number 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, and so on until you get to 10,001. Being sure to include 10,001 and the number 1 also in your summation. And your result should be this number, which you can compare with your result that you get. The next to do, to do 2, is to calculate the integer average of those numbers between 1 to 10,001. And you will skip a few numbers. By that I mean, do not include 10, 19, 21, and these numbers in the calculation of your average. So you must skip these numbers. So here's a tip. Not only will you be using continue keyword that you learned today in the for loop, but I would suggest you consider using the switch statement because it allows you to then specify a set of numbers which would apply in a certain case. So keep that in mind. Up to you, but there are a number of ways to do it. If you're stuck on coming up with a solution, take a look at mine. But keep in mind, when it comes to software program, there are several ways to achieve the same goal. Welcome to lecture seven, section two. And in this lecture, we'll be talking about the for statement. The for statement, as you will see, is very similar in its use to the if and switch statement. In those statements, the if and switch, we're able to control the flow of our application by taking different branches. What the for statement allows us to do is not only act like an if statement in terms of take different branch, but also to iterate a statement multiple time or a set of statement multiple time. So what we're really introducing here is the ability to loop. So let's take a look at the code. So here I am in my Visual Studio Code editor and I have a main.go file that is in my lecture 7 zero directory as expected and in section two. So I'm going to reduce this so we have some more place to type. So let's imagine that I wanted to print out a message five times. How will I do it? The only way I could think of possibly doing it is to type five messages. So let's do it. So this will certainly do what I want. And so we can test it by running and we'll get exactly what we expect. So that looks great. But look at the repetition that I had to do. I had to type these five messages five times. What if I wanted to do six or seven or sometime maybe read a variable to determine how many messages I should print out? This is when the for loop becomes handy. Notice how the for statement look very much like the if statement. I can easily substitute this for if instead of for, but now I'm going to use for because I want to loop. So let's run our program and see what we get. And look, our code runs, we get multiple execution of the same line, but it's going on forever. We have no way of controlling it. And that makes sense because what we have now is for true. So long as the condition is true, keep printing out messages. So we can remove this. And what we have just created is called an infinite loop. And this is a shortcut for an infinite loop also is the same as if we've typed true, but we don't have to type true. We get the same result where our code just keeps printing out messages. So what we want is some way of controlling 
how many messages should be printed out. So what about if we introduce a variable which we can count against how many messages we've printed out and have the condition for the for loop check that variable. So we start off by saying that we want to count from x equals one, and we want so long as for x is less than equals the total number of messages we want to print out. So we can put that as five, for example. Well, another way we can do it is we can introduce a constant to represent our number five, because notice we're typing five two times, and that tells us that we can easily make a mistake or forget things. So this is much better. So let's run our code and see what's going to happen now. Ah, it looks like we still have a bug because even though our for statement is checking this condition, this is always going to be true. We have no way of adjusting x so far such that it eventually equals or gets greater than five, which would make this loop false. So we need to increment x. We can certainly increment x by doing x plus equal one like this, or we can simply do x plus plus, which is a short end for the exact same thing as x equals x plus one, or okay. So let's run our program now and see what we get. And this works correctly, except we still have one bug, which is we're always printing out one instead of the current value of x. And our program is fixed now. So we have the same result as before when we started, but now we have it more compact using a for loop. Now there are other ways in which we can even make this even more compact. So I'll copy and paste this set of code and show you how we can change it. And to notice how we have this x variable, which is part of main, and when I try to create a new x variable, I'm of course getting a complaint because I already have an x variable in main. What we can do is move this as part of the for statement to make it, and again, just like the if and switch statement, it's a short declaration and it only applies, the variable x only apply within the bounds of the for statement. So now we can scope our variable to just be for the use of the for statement and this is much better. But once we've done this, notice how I'm getting a curly braces here and it's telling me that it is expecting a semicolon. And that's because once we decide to introduce a short declaration, now we have the short declaration that will be executed first, followed by the condition test to see if the condition matches. And later on, like I said with the if statement, when we have function, we can assign our variable or have it initialized from a function. We're going to check and see if that condition still holds before we execute even the very first statement. And after that, we're going to execute the statement, but we need a third part statement. And so we must introduce a semicolon and you'll see that pretty soon. So let's run our code now and this should still work. And we get the same result. Well, the reason why we need a semicolon here is because I said there's another part to this, and that is we can move this increment from inside the for statement to being a part of the initialization, check, and post increment. So what we're doing now is we're having the for loop control the initialization, checking the condition, and after each iteration of the loop, also executing this post statement here for us, whereby it will check to see after the post statement is executed, if the condition still holds. So we don't have to think about the management or even forgetting to properly increment our variable that drive our condition. So this is much cleaner and better if you decide to use something like trying to initialize and update your condition variables inside your for loop. So it's much better to do it this way. So this still works. So far, this is very nice, but what are the benefits of really being able to execute a set of statements in a loop other than to print out the same message multiple times, maybe with some variations? Well, let's come up with a contrite example. I'm going to pretend that oh, we have some data in a database and what we want to be able to do is read that data and then do some calculation from it. So first I'm going to paste in some code to represent the data we have in our database. And as before, I don't want you to think about it or look at how it's implemented unless you're curious. 
But really, that's not what I'm teaching right now. I'm only presenting this code so we can have a sort of a better example to work on. So let me paste in that code. So. I'm not going to explain the code because you're not part of what we're teaching right now. So just ignore it. So like I said, let's do some calculation with some sample data. And again, we're going to pretend that oh, we can get some data from a database or some file or somewhere. It doesn't really matter where I'm getting this data, but we want to do some calculation with it. So we want to do things like averages, totals, and so on. So let's imagine that you're provided with these two methods. You have a get number of item function, but when you call it, return the number of item in the database. Since you know the number of item, you can ask what is the cost of each item by calling the get item cost function and providing it with the item ID. Now, for our simple case, the item ID simply starts from one to the total number of items that are in the database. And if you pass it with call it with any other number, then you get zero instead as the cost because of course it doesn't know the, about that item, so it returns zero. So what can we do now? So let's start off by calculating the total number of items in our database. But for us to do, be able to do that, we have to iterate over all the item, get their cost, and then put it somewhere. So let's write a code. So now I want to print out some information. So I've printed out how many items we've processed and the total cost of all the items in our database. So you could pretend this item list that I'm getting is for a shopping cart or something like that, or a shopping list. And so 10 items process and the total cost is whatever there, almost uh, $10,000. However, this is not properly formatted as a currency. So let's fix that. So we're going to use the percent %f print specifier to say that we want to print this out as a float. And also we're going to do percent %2 to say that we want it to format with two decimal places. So this looks a lot better. And notice every time we run our program, we get a slightly different number because our data is being generated randomly. Okay, so this looks good so far. But what are the other things we can do? We can certainly do things like averages and so on. There's also one other thing I want to fix, and that is in my code, I'm calling get number of items more than once. It might make sense since I'm using the, the number of items is not changing, that I should just store this in a variable and call it once. Now here I have a problem. So I have, this is a float and I'm trying to divide it by an integer value. So in order to do this division, I need to cast, and I want my average cost to also be a float. So I should cast my int count here to also be a float. Now I don't have any error and I can run my code and check the result. So it makes sense. If we have 10 items and the total is about $10,000, it makes it means that the average cost should be about $1,000 per item. Okay, what are some other things we can do? We can check for the most expensive item in our database or shopping cart, and we can check for also for the least expensive. So let's do that. So now let's check our program. And it says the minimum price is zero. That's suspicious, but let's run again. And minimum price is always zero. So that doesn't seem to make sense that we have an item 
in our shopping list that's just zero dollars the max price seems to be okay that's certainly changing so what's going on with our program the problem here is how we're calculating or determining when to update minimum cost if the cost is less than the minimum cost we have recorded so far then we update minimum cost but by default our minimum cost is going to be zero so unless an item in our shopping list is negative min cost will never be updated so what we want to do we still need the condition that if a price is less than what we have recorded seen so far then we should update min cost we also want to say or do a or condition to say if min cost is equals to zero then we should certainly update our min cost to be whatever the current cost of the item is this would ensure that in the case of when we first come in the very first time that our minimum cost is set to the value of the first item in our shopping cart and after then if there's something else that's cheaper then it will be updated by this part of the code so this take care of the first iteration through the loop and then this take care of subsequent iteration notice there are other ways we could have done this we could have simply initialized minimum cost to be the value of the first item in our shopping list so long as we know that we had more than one item and now that's better so that looks correct so we fixed that bug so notice how with just a simple for loop we're able to derive quite a bit of information about the item in a shopping list we have able to calculate the total price the average cost cheapest item the most expensive item and we could continue and done even more things with this information but only with the for loop it makes it easy for us to do this if we scroll down and change the number of item in our database we don't have to modify anything else in our code and if we run it we should get expect to get the same correct result and that is because well the for loop abstract away the details of how many times to iterate by simply using variables and this is a good testament of how variables constants and these different flow control come together to write, help us write more useful and elegant programs finally let me give you a one last example so here we have a shopping cart with a certain number of items and we want to find out how many items are above a certain price so i'll start off by assuming that oh, we're going to look for items that are above maybe a thousand dollars how many items in our shopping cart is above a thousand dollars so we're going to reset and just work with 10 items to keep things simple but it doesn't matter remember once we write the code it will still work so let's write the code for that okay so let's look at the code we've just written so what we've done is we're going to look over the items in our database again get the price but this time we want to only count items that are greater or equals to the cutoff price which means that items that are less than our cutoff price we want to ignore them so we use this new keyword called continue here we're using the continue keyword and the continue keyword essentially says skip basically start over the loop and once we use the continue keyword it takes care of making sure that we still call the post increment whereas if we were managing this inside of our loop and we type continue well this loop would be short-circuited and we'll never get to the point where we would have been managing this condition variable so another reason why you want to make sure that you're incrementing your condition variables or at least you're taking care of them and being careful to take care of them such that something like a continue does not cause them to get updated okay so here we're simply saying if the price of the current item is less than the cutoff price continue which is update and go back and try again and only if the price is greater than equals or cutoff price since we will not go into this for a loop we'll go and increment the number of items so let's run this code this appears to be working and again just another example of how flexible the for loop is so we've seen with the for loop we can do iteration which we can execute the same statement multiple time we can also do things like skipping using continue so i think this is enough for the for loop for now take care good luck and see you in the next lecture so okay let's look at our exercise so we go to the stop directory and of course lecture exercise eight so this is your exercise to do one is for you to create a text chart with stars or pluses that correspond to the number that you get back from a list of numbers in other words you'll get a set of numbers that are between 0 and 10 inclusive and depending on which number you get you should use that many stars or pluses your choice 
to represent that number. What I mean by this is let's run my solution and show you what I mean. Then we'll get back to what you have to write. And as you can see, if I run my program and I get the number one, then I print out one star. If I get five, I print out five stars. In my case, I decide to use stars, but you can use plus sign if you like. As a matter of fact, even though I say use plus or star, if you like to use dashes, you can also use dashes. But I think dashes might be a little bit more difficult to see, but go ahead and try an experiment. But notice when I get zero, I don't print out anything. The requirement is that you must use at least one function that you have written and again use star or plus but i'll expand that to say if you test it with dashes and you like dashes that's fine and you will be using these two functions that i've provided that you need not look at their implementation the functions get list count tells you how many numbers are in the list and then you can go and get each value in the list and use that to determine how many stars you should print out Notice that your list count function return unsigned int. If you remember, we said unsigned means that you're only dealing with positive numbers. And that makes sense because since we're talking about how many items in a list, we can't have negative number. Also, in terms of getting the value for a particular number in the list, well, since we're only going to be dealing with unsigned numbers, well, it also accepts an unsigned int. Welcome to lecture 8 in section 2, functions, part 1. In this lecture, we're going to look at how we can define our own function. We'll see that functions can take parameters, they can even return values, but really functions give us a number of benefits. So let's take a look. So how would I define a function? It is my definition. I would say a function is a name given to a collection or a set of statements. So what if we can give a set of statements a name and then call them whenever we want? That gives us certain benefits. And one of them is reuse. We've seen this already. We've been using the printf function and we've been calling it over and over to do work for us. And yet we do not know all the statements that are involved within the printf function that's been hidden from us. And all we need to do is use the name. It allows us to organize our code. And there you can imagine that if we had the details of the printf statement and we had to paste it in our code every time we want to print something out to the screen, our code would be much longer and our program much longer and more difficult to understand. And abstraction. I mentioned this, and this is implied in the organization and reuse also. The fact that given a function name, you do not see the details of it unless you go and look at it, you are able to abstract away the implementation details and just focus on the use. So here I am, I'm in my Visual Studio Code editor as usual when we come to write code, and I have a empty main.go file, and it's in my directory lecture 08, which is in section 02 directory. Okay, what I want to do is I'm going to start by using code that we have already written. So I'm going to go back to lecture 7 and I'm going to copy all of the code from that lecture that we developed in the previous lecture and I'm going to paste it here for lecture 8. I'm going to scroll all the way to the top. Of course, I'm going to update the comment and so we're looking at functions and this is part 1. How do we write a function? Well, we've been writing functions for a while. Every time we develop a Go program, we've been writing the main function. Let's take this little line of print out message in this for loop and put it in a function. So first thing we do is you can imagine we reuse the F-U-N-C func keyword and let's call it print messages one. This is function one for print messages. And we're gonna write it like that. Notice how this looks very much like our func main. No, it doesn't take any parameter and there's nothing to return. So all we have to do is grab this and move it into there. That's it. That's our function. We've given a name to a set of statements. And so how do we call our function? Well, we just say print messages and that's it. Notice in Go, we still don't have to use semicolon unless we have multiple statements on one line like here where we have, this is a statement, this is another statement, so we need the semicolon. But other than that, that's called our function. And so let's run our program and we should get the exact same result as before. All right, there we go, nothing different. But notice when I said that oh, it gives you abstraction, if we're just looking at this main program, all we see is it calls a function called print messages one. 
we do not see the details of that function just yet. Okay, we can always go look at it, but for now, when we just focus in on main, we don't have to deal with it. That is abstracted away from us. So let's put these other statements into a function also. So let's create another function. And we call it creatively print messages too. And we'll put these statements in that function also. And we run our code and we get the exact same result. So by now, writing functions look pretty boring. You use a fun keyword, you introduce a name for the function and open and close parentheses and then a curly braces to delimit the body of the function. Now functions are a little bit more useful because as you can see from this print f function that is in the FMT package, we can pass values to it or parameters. So how do we write a function that accepts a parameter? So imagine that for our print messages to function, we want to make the total number of messages a parameter so it doesn't use our constant. So we can call this max, for example, and we can pass the max value here, basically a variable to our function. Oh, we, we're having an error here because it's saying that though max is undeclared. That's because we haven't said what type max is. And so we can see that here. Now, unlike declaring variables within our functions where we can say, you know, just var, when we declare a variable for a function parameter, we simply do not use the var keyword. It cannot be a short declaration, and we just have to use it this way. So you just say the name of the variable, again, identifier, and the type that is expected by that function. And so now notice we don't have any error, but we have an error here at line 30 because this function is saying, I expect a parameter and you not give me a parameter. So let's give it five. And the result when we run our program should be the exact same. Of course, now that we have a function that takes a parameter, we can change this to anything we want and simply compile and rerun our program. And as you can see, well, look at that. There's something wrong. So we have to go back and modify our program here. So x total number of messages. Oh, we did not fix this. So this should be max. And now everything is correct. So we had a little bug in our program. Okay, so, so far, it's very easy. What about all these statements here? We can put these in a function also, and we definitely should. It's sort of abstract away all of these calculations. So let's create a function. We can call it stat function or stats for short. Let's just call it stats. And we'll copy these lines that have to do with all this statistical calculation. I will put it in a function. So I'll force, I like the set of lines that I want to move into a function, I'll cut it and then put it in a function. So let's create a function and do that. Okay, since we moved the variable initialization for item count into our stats function, now we're getting a variable undefined or undeclared from our main program, but we can easily fix that by putting that here. And now if we run our program, nothing should change. Everything should work essentially the same, and it does. And what we're seeing is our main program is getting much more understandable. It's getting shorter, and of course, we can simply reuse any one of our functions. So for example, this function that takes a parameter, we can call it with, you know, two, and maybe seven. And if we run it, notice what we have, the expected result. So that's the nice thing about a function is that reusability that I mentioned is one of the benefits, abstraction and organization, okay? All right, final example. Let's also move this set of lines into a function. Once again, we get the expected result, no different. But since we know about passing parameters to a function, why don't we make our count above function also take a parameter where we can pass it the cutoff price? So for example, we can pass it, you know, the value $1,000 uh, as floating point number or whatever we decide to use. And we can also call it another time with maybe $1,500 as the cutoff price. So we want to count how many items are above these particular values. And since we'll be passing the cutoff price as a parameter to function, 
we can remove it from the name of the function. So let's go modify our code so that this works. And there we go. Our program is working as expected, and we have the ability of reusing our function multiple times for different cutoff prices. There's still more. So far, we've seen passing a parameter function. And we could pass multiple parameters, which we'll see in the next lecture. But we can also return values from our function. For example, we may not want our function, after it computes the number of items at our cutoff, to actually print the result. We might want to be able to use this in a number of different language locales. And if the function is printing it out, now it's doing two things. It's doing the calculation and the printout. So we might just want the calculation alone to be performed by the function. But then it, we control printing out of the value. Maybe we want to write it somewhere else or store it in another variable. So what we'll do is we'll cut this from here, remove it, and we'll move it into our main program where we print it out after we call the function. So what do we need? Well, we need to get the return value from our cut above function, and then we can call our printf. So let's do that. So now we've sort of modified what we want. We've said what we'd like to do is be able to call the function count above with a cutoff price, which we will pass in in a variable, have it return how many items that are in that price range and above, and then we'll control printing it out. And then, of course, we have to reinitialize our variable. And the only reason we're using a variable is because we're going to be using the same value in two places. So instead of typing it over and over, we decide to introduce a variable. But there's a problem here. Our function currently does not return anything. And we can scroll up and fix that. So what we want is after it's finished calculating, at the end of this for loop, we want it to return the number of items that has been cut off. And notice now we should change the name of this variable because it's no longer applied to just a 1,000. So this should be changed. And we want to return this value. When we say we want to return this value, Go complains that this is not an expected result because we haven't declared in our function signature that we are returning a value. So to do that in Go, we have to say what type we want to return. So these first parentheses represent the input or the parameter to the function. And then we can specify the return types here thing we're returning is of type int, so we can put that there. And just like we can have multiple parameters, we can specify by using, let's say, comma, next param, and the type, for example. We can also do the same thing with return. Go supports multiple returns. But we will see that in the next lecture. So let's wrap up here. I don't have an error. Let's run our program. And the result is just as before, except, you know, now, of course, since we're generating dynamic data, we're going to have different counts, but at least we know our program is working and we can now return a value from our function cut above. That's all for now. Take care. See you in the next lecture. Let's take a look at your exercise for this lecture. So we scroll down to the stop directory and exercise nine. Let's close this. So in this exercise, and you'll assume that you're given these two databases and essentially these four functions. Of course, you only care about the functions and you don't need to look at the implementation. But now I want you to update the cut above function such that it uses the parameters function values instead of calling these explicit functions. If you run into a problem, definitely check, check the solution. But hopefully this is sort of straightforward. Welcome to lecture nine in section two. And today we're going to continue with functions. So let's jump right into the code. And where I want to start is with a function that takes several parameters and returns several parameters. I mentioned before that function can take several parameters, and we've seen this because we can pass multiple parameters to like the print line function, for example. But we haven't written a function that takes multiple parameters. In our previous lecture, we wrote a function that took one parameter and returned one value. So let's do one that takes multiple parameters. So for this example, I'm going to imagine that I have two values and I like to swap them. To make sense of this, let's just pretend that for whatever reason, I need to swap the values that's in one variable with the value that's in another variable. So let's go ahead and write that code. Okay, so what I've done, I've written a function called swap and it takes two parameters. It takes S and T and they're both in. Notice I can write it this way because since they're both the same type, I don't need to repeat the type. This is sort of like when you're doing variable decoration, how you can 
say that you have multiple variables of the same type. Notice, however, when I have to do the return, I specify the two types that I'm going to return because I need to say that I'm returning two values instead of just one. And I need to enclose them in parentheses now since I have more than one value. We're saying I'm returning two integer values. My function is pretty simple. I just simply say return and I change the order in which I return the values. So I say return t first followed by s and that is essentially how we're going to swap the values. So let's run it and see if this works. So my expectation is that at first I should get 915 and then if I successfully swap the value I should get 159. And that's exactly what we get. Okay, so let's see another way in which I could write this very same program. So now we've written yet another swap function and they work exactly the same. The only difference now is that I have given names to my return variables. Instead of just saying I'm returning values of type int, now I'm saying I'm returning the values x and y. And at the end of my function, I simply need to just say return and Golang knows which variables I'm talking about because I already named them in the return part of the function. So this whole part of the function is considered the signature of the function or the type of the function. And we'll see a little bit more about that very soon. And this, of course, is the body. In Go, you must explicitly use a return statement. So if I remove this return statement, Go is going to complain because it's going to say that oh, you signal that you have some return values but you don't say when is it you want to return. And even though we already name our return variables, we could still, if we choose, return something else. So we can, for example, do 1025, and there's no problem here. We just still meet this requirement that we are gonna return two values, and that is exactly what we're returning. However, if we try to just return one value or one variable, something like that, that's a problem because it does not satisfy the function signature. So that's how easy it is to accept multiple parameters and return multiple values. Go function also support what's called variadic parameters. And this is when you can specify zero or more values for a particular type. So let's write a variadic function. So how is it possible that we can write one function that can either take no parameters, one, or any number of parameters? Now, I've specified four here, but we could use 10, 12 if we like. So this is a variadic function, and the way you define this function is like this. Okay, that's it. Notice all we had to do was put an ellipse, which are three dots, no space between the dots, between the name of the variable and the type. And now this says that V can take any number of parameters, including zero, to as many as you can type. Now, I don't know exactly what the limit is in terms of how many parameters you can actually pass, but it's just a large number. So let's run our program and see what we get. As you can see, when we print out the value of V when we pass no parameter, we get this empty thing with square brackets around it, and the type of it is square bracket int. We haven't covered what this is, but it turns out to be a slice. And so I wouldn't say much about it because we haven't covered slices yet. But just so you can see that we are getting the values we pass in here. When we pass one, we get the value one. And here we're getting those four values that we pass in. And we can, of course, like I said, pass in even more. But notice the type is always slice of int regardless of how many values we passed in. That is something we're going to come back to when we cover slices. We're going to revisit variadic functions. But since we're talking about functions, I thought that you should at least get an introduction to variadic functions. There's another thing that you should know about variadic functions. The variadic parameter must be the last parameter. And of course, you can only have one variadic parameter because otherwise, Go wouldn't know which one to use. So let me show you what I mean. So I've written this function, and it looks like it takes a string as the first parameter, and then the remaining parameters are optional. So that tells me that the second parameter is variadic. And then, of course, I was able to call the function several other times with, of course, the first mandatory or required parameter and then any number of the second parameters. So how might we define this? And essentially, that's all we need to do. Notice we have a string parameter as the first parameter, so this is always required. But since f is our variadic parameter, it must be the last parameter, that hence why we can call our function 
with absolutely no value for f, which is going to be an empty slice. And then eventually we can also pass additional parameters. So that is the key thing that if you're going to use a variadic parameter with other parameter, your variadic parameter must be last. Of course, you can use multiple other parameters. So for example, I can say C is an int, for example, and so on. So you could use many other parameters. The only requirement is that the variable parameter must be the last parameter. So let's talk about anonymous functions. So far, we've been doing name function. And you can see here, we have fun keyword followed by the name of the function and then the input specification to the function. And if there are optionally any output and they're followed by the body of the function, which is enclosed in these closing curly braces. But what is an anonymous function? So let's write an anonymous function. So I'm going to start by writing this function foo and I'll turn it into an anonymous function. Notice what I did just now. I wrote something that looked like a name function at first. And in order to change it to an anonymous function, I simply removed the name and then assigned the whole thing to a variable. Now, since I'm outside of a function, of course, I have to use a long version of variable declaration. But still, I'm just simply saying var foo is equal to this anonymous function. Why is this anonymous? Because our function does not have a name following the fun keyword. So why would we want to do this? First of all, let's see how we can use this before we can see some of the benefits of being able to store a function in a variable. Notice we call our anonymous function very much the same way like we call any other function. So once you have a function in a variable, you can just call it just like you would any other function, including passing parameters to it. Of course, our function foo doesn't take any parameter, but let's run our code. And the result is as we expect. So let's write another anonymous function and see some of the things that we can possibly do with this. Here I've written a very simple function, anonymous function, and all it does is it takes two parameters, a string, and how many times to print out that string with the word hi, comma, and the whatever string you pass in. But I've decided to save this into a variable, so it's an anonymous function, doesn't have any name, but now I've saved the value of that function into a variable hi. And so now we can go call this function hi using that variable. And everything worked just as we expect. Now, let's take a look at what the type of this variable is. Now that we have a function, anonymous function stored in a variable, what is the type of that variable? And we can see that the type of foo is just func open and close parentheses. This is basically saying a function that doesn't take any parameter and doesn't return anything. And for our high type, the type is a function that takes a string as its first parameter, followed by int as the second parameter. And notice the order here matters. And again, it doesn't return anything. So if this is the type of this function, we can certainly create a variable of this type. So I'm going to copy that. And I'm going to create a variable of that type. And now I have a variable high2, and its value is empty. It's nil. So we can print that out. Like I said before, at first, when we created our variable of this type, it got an initial value and that value was nil. Now you can see when I assigned it, it got another value. This is some location in memory where we can find the definition of this function high because that's the one I assigned. We don't really care what that value is. All we care about is that we can assign it and we can, of course, call it. And notice it works just the same because we have a value or a reference to that function in memory. So it doesn't really matter if we call it true high using the name high or the variable name high two. Now, all I'm doing is getting a, uh, a warning here from Golang telling me that the parameter that we passed to printf basically is just the name for a function value, but it's not, the function is not being called. But we don't intend to call the function. We actually just want to print out the function value. Not very useful but I want to show you that it is a variable and it contains a value.
Some things that you can do with anonymous function is actually make it very easy to reuse code because since function variables are first class students in, in Go, we can pass them to other function. We can have functions return them. Remember, they're just variables. So we can say that a function takes a function variable. And so let's go back now and look at how we might do that with some of the code we've written before. So I'm going to go get the code from lecture eight that has to do with our stat function. So I'm going to copy stat function. And I'm going to paste it. Uh, let's paste it above here for now. So this is just our stat function. Remember, it's calling this function get number of items, which will return the number of items in a database. And it's also calling a function get item cost, which it calls to get specific cost. What if we were to pass those two functions to stat functions? What would that mean for us? Well, let's just realize that the signature for this function, get number of item, is simply a function that takes no parameter and return an int. The signature of this function is a function that takes an int and return a float 64. So if we put those as parameters to our stat functions, then this error message will go away. And then we can pass any number of functions to stat. And let's see that. Notice our error went away. That's because we're saying get number of items is a function value. And we can call it here to get that number of items. Of course, when it comes to calling our function, we have to be able to pass it functions values where this is implemented such that they meet the specification of our signature. So let's call stats here. But before I call stats, I need to get those functions that I mentioned which implements the value that we want. Let me copy something here. Imagine that you're given this. So let's close this to get some room. So imagine that you're given two databases, database one and database two. You don't know which, which values are in each database. Imagine that each database contain shopping cart list for different users, for example. And you need to calculate some stats on each shopping cart. So you have a function get number of items from database one which will return the number of items in database one. You have the function get item cost database one, which will return the cost of an item in database one. And correspondingly, you have the same thing for database two. So you have four sets of function and two of them operate on each database. Now we want to be able to use stats, which we have written and we don't want to rewrite it for each one of the databases. But now since we can pass function signature, we can just pass the appropriate function to our stat method and it would operate on the database. So if you find this confusing, best to go back and look at our simple example of high and high two, and then just realize that we're just extrapolating that now to our stat function. When it comes time to call our function here, we really just need to pass the implementation of those function, their names. So let's get the implementations of those, which you don't need to look at. This is just part of the exercise for me to be able to give you an example. And so you're not going to care about the implementation of these functions. The only thing you care about is that you can use them. And let's do it. Notice we do not want to actually call the functions. We just want to pass a reference or the value to our stat function. And that's all we need to do. So here we are using our stats function. Are we using them two different databases? That's because the functions we're passing, those functions know how to access the different databases and we have the correct signature. So let's run our code. And look at this. In database one, we had 10 items and these are the stats for it. In database two, we had seven items and these are the stats. You can imagine reusing the same sort of idea on multiple different examples where the implementation details is in the function that you pass into yet another function. So it's a way to extract part of the behavior out of a function. And notice the simple change we made. We simply pass these two functions as reference to our stat function and within stat function, change the variables to represent functions. And that's it. There's a very straightforward example, I think. It's sort of a little contrived, but hopefully you can see how this can be extrapolated into more complex things. Good luck. See you in the next lecture. So let's take a look at your exercise. And it's a simple to do. You're going to take the cut above function from the previous exercise, exercise nine. If you did that exercise to now change the type of these two parameters 
here to just say that I'll give them a name, a simple name, instead of having to specify it in the function signature because it's harder to read this way instead of if you just had it type and then someone can look up the type if they like. So that's all there is for that exercise. Welcome to lecture 10, section two. And today we'll be looking at type declaration. However, what I'm gonna show you today is not everything we will learn about type in this course. In future lectures, we will see how we can use type with structures and interfaces. But for now, I will still want you to spend some time playing with the exercise, looking at the code, and definitely do the reading assignment for the Golang language specification where to talk about types. Okay, so let's jump into the code. For our example on type, I'm gonna come up with something a little bit contrived. Let's imagine I am dealing with prices, well, currency in other words, right? So I have two price items that I wanna track, so I'm gonna create some variables for them. So I have two float values that represent the prices for something, doesn't really matter right now. And I've taken the sum of it total for those two items and I'm printing it out. So let's run this and see what we get. Okay, that looks fine. But what if I wanted to calculate the average of these prices? So let's write a function that calculates our average and then we'll print that out. So that's it, very simple. You can write your function anywhere. We've been putting it above main and we'll still do that with some of our function, but you can literally put it anywhere above main, after main, it doesn't matter. So let's run a code and see what we get. Notice there's a slight problem. When I take the average of my two prices, I end up with three decimal points. I'm dealing with currency, so I only need two. Of course, we know we can format this. And of course, this doesn't even look like a price. It'd be nice if we had the dollar sign in there to actually say, oh, this was, you know, dollar. Or if you're dealing with pounds, you have the pound symbol. So let's go fix those two things. So this looks a lot better. Wouldn't it be nice if Go had a type called currency? and it took care of formatting itself with a dollar sign and only two decimal places. Unfortunately, Go Lang or no language can anticipate all the possible types that you will want to use. So they generally give you a mechanism where you can define your own types and then do things like allowing them to be formatted when they're printed and so on. So let's define our own type called currency and then we'll eventually work towards getting it to print itself properly. And that's it. Basically, all we're saying is we use the type keyword, just like we, when we were using variables, cons. If you look at in Go, the pattern is very simple. Pretty much anything you need to define starts off with a keyword. So when we want to define a package, we set package first. When we want to import something, we set imports. When we want to introduce a variable, we set var. When we want to introduce a cons, we say cons. Once we want to introduce a function, we say func. And now we want to introduce a new type, so we say type and we give it a name. And the new type we want is currency, and we have to base it on some other existing type. It doesn't have to be a built-in type, it could be based on some other type that we also have defined. Here, we're gonna base it on float64 because that's most closely resemble the types that we've been using to represent our currency. So let's base it on float64. So what does this do for our code? Well, we, we just introduced the type, but we haven't used it. Well, we know from before, if you want to use a type with a variable, we have to use the long form instead of the short form. So let's change our values to use the type currency. No, we have getting a warning. It's saying that, oh, our average function takes float 64. The key thing in Go is once you introduce a name type, it is distinct, it is different, and please do the reading assignment so that I can explain this to you. You can see the, the reason for this, but it's very different from the type float 64. So currency, even though its base type is flow 64, it is not the same thing. So we can either cast our price one and two to flow 64, which is what our average function expect, or we can simply change the type of our average function so that it accepts currency and return currency value. And now when we run our program, we can see that everything still works fine, addition, averages, it still works because it's based on that fundamental type of float and Go still knows how to do floating point arithmetic. So we don't use the ability to use those operations, but notice the type of our variable now A, it actually says it's of type main that currency, telling us it's a type currency that was defined in the main package. So any other file we had, so long as they 
are belong to the main package, they're going to be able to use our currency type also. So even if somebody else defined a currency type in their own program in another package, it would not collide with the currency that we're using unless we explicitly import that type and also use it. So this is a little bit step forward, but it still doesn't help us in the sense of currency knowing how to format itself because we still had to specify that we want to format this as a quote unquote value with two decimal places. Let's write a format function that we can use to format currency values. Okay, so we've written this very simple function. We says call it format currency and we pass in a currency value and we return it a string. Now we've used the sprintf method from our FMT package. What that does, it operates pretty much just like the printf, but instead of writing the result out to the terminal, it returns it as a string. So it's going to take our currency value, which we're going to now cast to float64, and then say we want to format it as a floating point value. Now, in this example, we really don't need to cast our currency to a float64. As you saw, it worked earlier when we said just format this currency as a float, it did it without saying, oh, I don't know what that is. Let's say you introduce a type whose base type is string, and then you try to use it without casting, you can run out to a, like a circular dependency. I'll talk a little bit more about it in a few seconds. But for now, just understand that all our function here is doing is taking a currency, formatting a nice little string with a dollar sign and only two decimal places, and it returns that string. So now, anywhere where we want a currency to be formatted correctly, we just simply call this function. And since we, our format currency function is doing the formatting for us, we don't need to do that here. We can just simply print it out as a value. Now, if we run our program, we get the same result because we're using the format currency function to format our currency type values. Well, this still seems a little bit cumbersome because we have to call this format currency everywhere we want to be able to format a currency type. It would be nice if we can do something maybe like say invoke a method on a type or a type instead. So instead we can say something like, if we can do it, this, this is a little bit better than what we were doing before, but let's see if we can do that. Fortunately, in Go, Go is an object-oriented programming language, and in order to introduce a method on our type, we simply have to make it a receiver. So how do you define a receiver? Let me write that for you. And that's it. I literally took the parameters that was being passed to the function and put it in front of the function name between the fun keyword and the function name, and now what we have is C is a receiver of type currency. And once we have that, notice I do not have an error here. What I've done is pretty much tacked on this function to this type. So any variable of type currency can call this format currency function. And if we rerun our code now, we'll see that it still works. But I still don't like this, even though it's slightly better that we can have a method on our type very easily by simply defining receivers. And we could add as many methods as we like. It would be nice if we can simply type the currency value and have it be formatted correctly. So we want to be able to have something like this and know that our, our format currency method will be called automatically. And we can do that simply by changing the name of this method to string. And if we do that, Go automatically has a built-in support for any method on a type that has the signature string as the function name and return the string type as a value, it will call it automatically for you. So notice I changed the method name from format currency to simply string and I remove the explicit call. And now when I rerun my program, I get the same result. So this is a lot better than what we started out with. We introduce a currency to represent the concept and the ideas we're dealing with and we were able to introduce a method on that type using this receiver. And now we can use the type to print out itself. And we don't have to think about how it should be printed because we've decided that once and we don't have to keep repeating ourselves. I've also mentioned that since we have introduced a new type currency, that currency and float are not the same thing. And we saw that when we add our average function and it was taking a float, we couldn't call it with a currency because it didn't know what that was.
now if we change format currency here to a float for example 464 and say it returns a string so we do that and now i try to call format currency with let's say one of our prices of course we get an error message but of course we can pass a float but we cannot pass a currency because currency and float are two different types i can cast my price to a float and this works but now that we know how our currency has its own method of formatting we don't really need to go through this trouble of casting it to a float and then passing it to a function. I just want to show you, I, once again, that there are two different types. So let's do one other thing with types. I mentioned that types are like var const import in that instead of having to list them multiple times, you can also use this approach. And this works too when you have multiple types. So let's continue with our example and then wrap up. So I've written two functions and they're not very difficult at all. They simply return a string, but we can tell that both of these functions are of the same type, which means that ignoring the function name, remember we don't care about the function name when we talk about type, we look at simply the input parameter and the output parameter. And so both of these functions take no input and return a string. So they're the same type. So we can create a type to represent these two functions. So we can say that we have a new type called greeter which is of type function that takes no parameter, but returns a string. And now we can declare variables that can point to either one of these two functions. But we're not gonna create a variable. Instead, we're gonna write another function, which we're gonna call our say function. It's gonna make sense what I'm doing when I finish writing the code. What am I doing? Well, I have this function called say, and it takes a variable called greet, and which is of type greeter, which means any function that satisfies this function signature. And it prints out a message by first calling the greeter function so it can get that particular greeting. And then it greets with whatever parameter I pass in as the second string, it prints out the second string. So you can see that this just get call and gets us our string. So we print out essentially two strings. What that allows us to do in our main program is to say something like this. And now when we run our program, we get the expected result which it should be hi world and good morning world. And what we've done is simply delegate the particular greeting we want to these function. And now our safe function can just use them to do some of the work by calling them to get whatever the greeting is gonna be and then print out the string. Again, that's a little bit contrived, but what I've done is show you how, once you have a set of function, how you can introduce a type to represent the function signature. And now that makes how you define other functions that might use a function variable easier or more understandable. Thanks for your time. See you in the next lecture. Let's look at your exercise. So if I scroll down to stub, then exercise 11. Exercise for this week is described in a markdown document, which is just a text file. And you can see the text file here, and this is just how it is rendered. But you don't need to worry about how it's rendered or how it's written. Just focus on your to-do. So you will create a package called SA for secret agent. That's your first to do. And that should tell you right away that you will need a subdirectory called SA within your exercise directory. And then you will create some files to put in the SA package directory. And some of the things that you will have in your files are going to be the agent name, their full name, current mission, current location, and salary. And I want you to decide what types these should be which should be integers, float, strings, and so on. The next thing I'd like you to do is write another file, add it to your SA package, and provide some functions that would allow access to the code name of your agent and its full name. Hint, hint, those are gonna be your exported member from the package. The next thing, your fourth thing is to do is to write a program that demonstrate that you can use your new package. Welcome to lecture 11, section two. And today we're gonna to start looking at packages. And this is packages part one. So before we jump into some code, let's just remind ourselves what Go program. As we said, all Go executable program must have a main package. More than likely, your 
application will also require the use of other packages, whether those be packages you write, packages provided as standard packages by the Go language itself, or packages you get from somewhere else. And the other important thing was that in your main package, you had to have this main function, which was the entry point to your application. So here I am in my Visual Studio Code editor, and I have lecture 11 directory. It's currently empty. I can create a file, of course, my golang main.go file. And for this exercise, the code I want to use is what we develop in lecture 9. So I'm going to go back to lecture 9, and I'll copy that. As a matter of fact, I could have just simply have copied the directory itself without having to worry about copying the text. So let's imagine I didn't have the file. I could have said copy and just paste. Okay, so now I have the code from lecture 9 in this directory, so in lecture 11. And of course, we have to change this. We're doing lecture 11, and this is packages, part 1. So, well, actually, it helps if I keep this open now so I can see the files I need to create. So what is a package? Here, we're importing a package called FMT, and we import it in this string. And we see that we can use it simply by using the same name that we put in the string. We use the same name here to refer to that package and then the methods or whatever that package export to us. So let's create our own package. And we are already doing that by having this main file. And remember, the first thing you have to say for each Go source file is which package it belongs to. So I'm going to create a package for our swap functions. I'm going to call that file swap and move these two functions into it. All I did was create another Go file, set that it's belong to the main package, which also means that our main.go and swap.go belongs to the same package, and then move the file from main.go into swap.go. Well, I haven't really changed anything, except now I've reduced the amount of code I have in one file. And now I have two files in one package. So how do we run our program now? And we notice our program runs the same, but it didn't work if I just specify the main that go file because now our program is in two files, so we need to specify all the files. Let's go back to our main that go file. And let's see what else can we move into a package. So for example, I might decide that we have this formatter, we have foo, we have i. I'm going to move those also into a separate file. I could call the file anything I want. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to simply just call it file.go. Not a very creative name, and I don't recommend you do that. But just to show you how the name of the file doesn't really matter, it's just the packages belong to, which is specified in the file. Again, I specify three files belonging to the same package main, and everything should work the same way, and it does. As you can imagine, I'm looking for files that I can move out from my main.go because it's very long. So the next move is function. So let's do that. Now we're seeing an error. And notice where the error occurs. Here, it's saying that FMT package is not being imported. So now we import what we need in this file. Let's rerun our program. And again, it still works. No surprise. Well, since I'm looking to clean up my main.go file, the next thing I'd like to do is move all the supporting function and variable into a package of its own. OK, so now I've moved those functions into its own package called database package. And notice I call this file file.go also because, like I said, the file name doesn't matter. It's the package it belongs to. 
And so the importance of this file is that it belongs to this database package. And we know that from the fact that the file declares that it belongs to the database package. How do we use it now? In our main program, notice we're getting this error. It's saying it doesn't know this is undeclared. And it should, because this is no longer defined in the main package, it's defined in the package DB. First thing we need to do is we should compile our package and install it. Then we can use it. So how do we do that? Now so let's type the go doc command in our package direction. It says there's a package here called database and the way you use it is by saying import this. So I'm going to copy this because we'll need this in our main function in order to use this package. But our package is still not yet available for use. So I still have to install it. And that's all it takes to install our package. If we look in the directory where packages are stored, we should see one for this package. And there it is, db.8. Okay, so now we have this package compiled and installed. How do I use it? So what we do is we use the last word of our import statement. So I need to use db before my function names here. But I'm still getting an error. This still is not working. If you look at the names, they're lowercase. Maybe you haven't noticed it, but when we're using functions from other packages, the name begin with an uppercase. And that is the key. The way you export something from a package is by using an uppercase letter. And the way you make it private is by using a lowercase letter. So right now, these functions are defined within our package. However, they are considered to be private. If we want to make them public, we have to use uppercase letter. So let's change these to uppercase letters. Then let's go to our package and of course change the names to uppercase also. Now notice in our package, the only thing we're exporting are the functions, but our variables db1 and db2, they will remain private. So anyone using our package, they don't need to see the implementation details of how we're storing data. So let's go back to main let go. And now notice our error goes away because now those methods are exposed. And we can check that by doing db and we should only see the four methods we expose and not the variables. Since our package is already compiled and installed, we should be able to just run our program as before and it should work. And there it is. Take care, see you, practice, post questions if you have them. See you in the next lecture. Let's take a look at your exercise. So this exercise is pretty simple. I provided a number of packages and you can import those packages by issuing this command. If we're to copy this, I can say install those packages. In this exercise, the task is to do a simple to do, which asks the user for the name. And I give you a hint that you should use input that read strength. You could print a greeting to the user. Then you should use the other functions in the calc package and you can print out the date and time. So here's an example of what your program should look like. When you run your program, it should prompt the user for the username. Let's say to say Feral. It can say hi or hello or whatever you want and then tell them the date and time. And that's pretty much it. The whole purpose of this exercise is to get you comfortable with using packages that are provided by somebody else and how to use it. Welcome to lecture 12, packages part two. And today we'll be continuing looking at packages and some of the capabilities that packages give you. So I want to jump right into the code today and let's write a package. So here I am in my Visual Studio Code Editor and it's my lecture 12 directory and it's empty. The first package I want to create is a package called log. Now my logger package is going to do some simple login in a way that I like. So let me write that code first. As you can see, this is a very simple log function. I use an uppercase because I want this function to be exported. And of course I should put a comment. That's what a complaint is about that says, oh, any exported member from the package should have some documentation. So I can do that. So go vet is happy and now I can start using my package. But before I do, I want to add a few more files. I want to add a file for error and warn.
okay there we go that's my logger package and it contains three functions written in tree file now i want to exercise my login package so i'm going to write a main function that uses our logger package Now, before I can use this logger package, port it using a relative import, but I don't like to do that. A relative import would look like this. So there are two ways I can use it. a relative import like this or the much longer way like this. So I don't like relative import, so I'll use the much longer way. Go install and then the package. And that would install it for me. But now I can run my program. And there we go. So nothing fancy so far. This we've seen before. What I want to show you though, is that there are also other login packages. Um, for example, I like using Logros. And so now this package is gonna be referenced by using Logros as the name. Nothing surprising there, and let's run our program again. So two different ways of printing out error messages. So, what about if I don't want to be using logger or logros, I simply just want to use log. So I want to switch between loggers very easily and don't have to think about it. And so maybe what I really want to do is rename these accordingly. So maybe if I decide to change from logros and use my own, I want to import it under the name log instead of logger. So this is another way of importing where you can overwrite the default package name with another name of your choice. So you essentially introduce an alias for that package. And of course, just as we can introduce an alias for the package, we could still import with both packages and give each of them a different name. So I, for example, I could call this log1 and mine log2, and then of course, call them individually. And that still gives me the benefit of having both of them. So I can use them with their default name or given an alias. So that's one new thing we have learned is how to introduce a new name for a package. Another feature of packages is the ability to import all the exported members. And so for example, if I wanted to import all the exported members from the logger package that I wrote, I can simply use a period here to say import everything or what I call a full import. What it allows me to do now is to call the error function without having to qualify it with a package name. And as you can see, no, I do not get an error here because I've imported the public members, which include this error function from the loggers package. So let's run the code. And the result is the same. I'm still calling my error package because I've done a full import. And so I can, for example, change this to warn and remove this. and I can use all those members. Of course, since I'm no longer using the Logros package, it's gonna give me an error saying that I've imported a package that I'm not using. So that is just an example of how you can do a full import. I wouldn't recommend doing a full import because while it makes it very easy to use the members from that imported package without having to qualify it, and Go Compiler will warn you if there are name collisions, I think it's much more readable and easier to maintain code when you can just look at identifiers and tell whether they are imported or they are from the package that you're in. Another feature of packages is the ability to run a function or a number of functions before the package is used. Let me show you what I mean. So for example, in my main package here, I can add an init function. It doesn't really matter where I add it, so I'm gonna put it at the bottom for now. Actually, let's put it on top. And notice this function takes no parameter, does not return anything. And I'm going to let it, in this case, just print out a message. If I run my program, you can see that the init function was called first before my main function even gets called. And so this allows you now to do certain initialization and set up in your packages when they are imported, or the first time they're imported by in another file. So for example, I can copy this function and I can paste it and create multiple init function. And this is the only time when you could have multiple functions with the same name. And the reason why is because you are not calling these init function, the go runtime is. If you were trying to call these function, then you wouldn't be able to 
differentiate between one function or the other but the go runtime is calling it so you don't need not worry about them having the same name this is the only exception to functions having the same name and so i can have multiple init function in the same package even if it's in the same file or multiple different files and as you can see both my init functions get called okay so let's put some init functions in our logger package also and so let's stick some one in each one of the files as you can see here we had the init methods from the logger package being called before the init method of main let's write another package and see what happens if that package also have init methods. Okay. So I have another package called math, and it's exporting this variable pi, which is initialized from the standard package math.py, but could have set it to anything, so it doesn't really matter. Um, the important thing I wanna do though, is I wanna show you what happens if I now have, let's say the math package import the logger package. So now we see that my math package imports the log package, but I'm not using my math package. Oh, I need to do that. Um, so I'm going to import my math package here. Um, it doesn't matter where. And so what I'm doing here is I'm using an underscore. So we've seen so far, or oh, you can import a package, use the default name. You can import a package with a different name. You can import every member from a package. And now I'm importing a package for its side effect. What that means is I want the init method for that package to run, but I don't actually want to use the package later on in my program. So there's no way for me to refer now to the math package after this point. I just simply need the side effect of having the init methods for that math package run. So now, as you can see, the init for the logger needs to be called first because math imports the logger package. Init for logger must call first, followed by math in its method, and then my main package init methods can be called next. So we can see that regardless of how complicated our nesting of imports, Golang would figure out which package is ultimately at the root of the initialization and make sure you call those init functions for a sec. So init functions and init methods, these are, they don't, they're not attached to a type. So let's call it, it's a function. So make sure that your init functions do not have any dependency between them in terms of requiring which init methods should be run first. So that's it. Take care. See you in the next lecture. Bye. Welcome to lecture 13, which is a review of section two. In this lecture, we will pick up some miscellaneous ideas that I left out on purpose because I think it would have been too much material to cover in the section and have an exercise. So instead, we can sort of go over them quickly. Since you have the foundation already, you're going to be able to pick up these other concepts very easily. One of the things we're going to do is we're going to review constants. And there, we saw that how constants can have arbitrary precision. And the consequence of that is that you can write them but only when you are ready to use them, then Go forces you to make sure that they can fit into some sort of one of the predefined types. We're going to also look at a pre-declare identifier called IOTA. It's a special type of variable that allows you to use with constants in declaring numeric constants that have increase in values. So it doesn't make sense now until you see an example. When it comes to variables, we left out something called a blank variable identifier, and we'll see where that comes in useful. We're also going to look at scope. Now, we've sort of mentioned that functions, if statement, for loops, all those things introduce a scope, but we never really stop to really think why. And it turns out that the key to it is your open and closing parentheses. Anywhere you have an open and closed parentheses, you're going to introduce scope. And we'll show that. And just a reminder with complex, you can get the real and imaginary parts of it using these built in functions. You don't need to import anything to get it. We can see how the blank identifier can be used in if and for statements. When it comes to functions, we're going to review variadic functions. And 
We can also look at the error type and the errors package. We can see that though, being able to create your own errors in Go is very, very easy. Errors are sort of built in with the language. We can look at a function called before. It's not very useful now, but it's gonna come in very handy later on when we start allocating resources. We can also look at closures and what those are. We sort of touched on it when we did anonymous function. We really didn't delve into it too much. So like I said, everything that we're doing here in the miscellaneous are things we sort of did, but we didn't explore it in detail. Then we'll look at fetching packages. So let's jump into the code. Quite a bit to cover here. As before, the first thing I want to start with is constants. So let's do that. What we're talking about here is arbitrary precision. So let's create a pretty large constant. So there's a very large constant that went off the screen and you can just type anything essentially. The important thing is notice that I do not have an error in my Go program. I can test this by running my program now. And runs without problem. However, if I try to assign this integer on type integer constant to an integer, I will have a problem. Or even if I simply try to print it out. And you can see the error message there is that our untyped integer, and it knows it's an integer constant, cannot fit into int, which seems contradictory because it's saying it's an integer, yet it's saying it can't fit into int. And so we know that one of the reasons is because Go allows you to type these arbitrary precision constants that can be as long as 256 bits, but the largest int that we have is 64 bits. Well, we can do calculations with this constants to make it fit into an int, or we can see if we can fit it into a float. Of course, once we put it in float and point format, we wouldn't be able to see all our precision necessarily. And that seems to work. Of course, we can run it and print it and see what we get. And it's represented as a floating point number, bunch of decimal places, and e to the 99. Well, that is just one thing to be aware of with constants and their arbitrariness in terms of integer constant. The other thing I want to show you is IOTA. So let's say I wanted to define some constants to represent the days of the week. So I might assign Monday zero and so on. So let's do that. So now I have my constant defined. I can, of course, print them out. All right, so let's run this. And we see a problem. Sunday has the value three, Thursday is four. And yes, I made a mistake here and I could certainly rearrange things by moving this down. But no, Thursday still has an invalid value. And so I would need to go back and change the value. And if I had a long list of constants, maybe these intermediate one would also have an invalid. So what IOTA allow us to do is not have to think about the increase in value we assign to a set of constant. We can just assign it IOTA and IOTA keep track of the numbers. So let's see how that would help us. So now I've assigned each one of my numeric constants IOTA. What does this do for us? Let's run our code and see. And notice now they have the correct value. See, even if I had made that mistake before, let's go back and do that. Sure, I still have the same error, but notice how easy it is for me to fix it. Again, this is sort of a contrived example, but you can imagine that how you had a long set of constant that you need to initialize, and maybe you have to do some bit manipulation. This is often used when we do bit mask. So come back and go land for adventures where we're going to do some more low level system programming, and you'll see how something like IOTA comes in handy. Here it doesn't seem that useful, but I still wanted to introduce you to IOTA and let you know that it can only be used with constants while you declare your constants, but it's built in and it's provided for you. So let's look at variables. So I said one of the things that we didn't talk about is the blank identifier. So the way this comes in Andy is when you have multiple assignments. For example, let's say we want to assign some values to X and Y. So we know that works and it doesn't really matter if I use short declaration or the long declaration still works. And I can run this program, but I'm not going to waste the time to do it. So a blank identifier is when you want to ignore an assignment. So we can use an underscore to say, oh, I do not care about this first value, for example, 
no, you might say, well, why type it in the first place? I just want to illustrate how it's used. Later on, we'll see how it comes in handy when you can control the number of values that are being assigned. And instead, the only control you have is to say whether or not I want to ignore that value that's being returned to. But it's mostly come in handy when you call functions and so on that return multiple values. But the underscore, the blank identifier can only be used when you do an assignment, but you cannot be used after. So I cannot say, for example, what is the value of the blank identifier? That's not valid. It's not actually an identifier. It's just sort of a placeholder for when you want to ignore an assignment. So this works. As you can see, I don't have an error in my code. And I could put it anywhere I like. So I can replace it. If I didn't want the value, the second value, I can replace it there also. And this works fine. So now I'm saying the only values I'm interested in is 9 and 21, and I want to ignore 15 and 32. So you could use the underscore blank identifier any number of times if you like. And the reason why is because it's not actually an identifier. It's just a feature of the language. And so this works. And of course, if I want to ignore everything else, I can certainly use it multiple times. So that works. Too. So we'll come back to this in a bit. One of the things I want to talk about is scope. So you know that once we have a function, it has a certain scope. So the variable defined in this function, like y, for example, is only valid from the point at which it's declared until the closing of that function. Whereas if I had a function, let's call this function foo, and I'm going to give it an input parameter. Now, this x is a variable of this function, and it's valid within the entire scope of this function. That means from the beginning of the open parentheses to the closing parentheses, regardless of how large this function is. Okay, I said that open and close parentheses introduces a scope. If that is true, then I should be able to type open and close parentheses and call this scope one, for example. And then I should be able to declare a variable within here and then even have nested scopes. So let's do it. And as weird as this looks, this is valid. As you can see, I don't have any error in my code. And what I've done is I've created a new scope from here to here in which the variable x is valid. It's valid inside of the scope and any nested scope. And then I've created even a, a nested scope called 2, and it has introduced its own new variable called y. And we know this is valid because there's already a variable y out here. And if there was any collision, well, I would have gotten an error message. But because this is its own new scope, this y variable shadows or hides the y in main, but it is its own y variable. And if I run this code, I should be able to see it. Now, once I reach the end of this closing parentheses, y is no longer valid. All right? At this point, y doesn't exist at this point, but x is still valid. And the y that is valid here, so we can say y that scope 2 is no longer valid but y from main is valid. So keep in mind, every time you see open and close parentheses, it introduces a scope. You are very unlikely to see anyone write code like this, but know that's how it's possible. And the real key is that open and close parentheses introduces a scope. And it's really no different than if we said this, right? We know that though using the if statement would introduce its own scope or a for loop, for example or switch statement, or if we were to write a function. We have just written an anonymous function here and assign it to this variable x. Of course, we're not using x right now, so it's complained that our x is declared or not used. But notice that they all still introduce scope. The other thing we did was we talked about complex numbers and how you can get the, the real and imaginary parts of it from the built-in functions. Just so we expect no surprise there, just remember those are available to you. You don't have to import anything to get them. And we're going to see other functions like those eventually that you can use without having to import it. We're going to see another one before we end this lecture. So I show you how the blank identifier comes in handy if you're going to use it in something like a, a statement or a for loop. And even when you want to do multiple assignments, when you have a function, imagine we had a function that we're returning all these different values because our function can do multiple returns. 
So how might you use this on an if on a for loop? Let's say, for example, I wrote the function to return the quotient and the remainder of two numbers. So I've used my divide function. I said, if you do a division and you get back a quotient that is greater than zero, then I want you to print this statement. So let me know that, oh, well, the division resulted in a non-zero quotient. Second example is I use the for loop, call the same function where I ignore the first return value, and I just look at how many things are remaining, and I simply want to print how many things are remaining. So this is an example where you might call a function and return multiple values, and then you can use the blank identifier. And we'll see that in the very next lecture, we talk about arrays and slices, how we can use the blank identifier to say which part of an iteration we're interested in. So let's run this code. At least I think you know how it's going to work, but let's just run it anyway. And as you could see, when we divided 9 by 15, we had 9 remainder, and that's what we have here. I mean, of course, we could have printed it out if we wanted to, but I trust that you agree that this is working correctly. And of course, we don't see anything provided here because our quotient was actually 0. It wasn't greater than 0. When we talk about function, we remember we had this idea of a variadic function. A variadic function was simply a function that took zero or more values, and it was designated by using an ellipsis between the identifier and the type. And so if you have a function like this, and I'm not really doing anything in the function, I just want to show you that oh, it has a variadic parameter. And remember, we said that oh, if you have a variadic parameter, it can only be one. And once we have this, now we can call v with no parameter, v with one parameter, or v with any number of parameters. And we were able to print those out, and we saw it was a slice of int. And so we said it was a slice of int. And of course, we haven't covered slices yet in the next lecture. So one other thing I wanted to show you was this error type. So now, let's say when we were writing our function at the cost of an item, we said that you first had to call get number of item, then you pass the ID representing the item whose cost you wanted to get. But we had no way of really checking that if a user passed an invalid item ID, how to let the user know that oh, that was invalid. All we did was return like zero or something. But what if we wanted, since we can return multiple values from a function, why don't we return an error that says this is an invalid thing? So let's write the function we think we want, and then we'll build it up from there. This is the cost if we have a valid item ID. If we have an invalid item ID, we want to return a second parameter that signal that oh, the item ID was invalid. So what should that be? Well, if we can use like a int, for example, if you come from C, C++, we might return zero if everything is good and minus one or a non-zero value to represent I thought there was a problem. But in Go, we can do better than that. We know, for example, that we can introduce our own type. So why don't we introduce our own type called error, for example? And we're going to write that by creating a file called error we we'll put it in the main package. And since we know that oh, when you create your own type, you can have a nice function that prints out how that type should be represented. So we're going to also add a string method to that type. So let's implement that. OK, so what I'm doing is I've declared my own type called error, which is based off of the string type. I attach a method to my type by using the receiver. We did something very similar in lecture 10 where we created our currency type. So now that we have our type, this is ready to use. So let's use it in our function. So now we have a function that is sort of nice to use because now we can return, create a new error with a string because basically, remember, this is a new type that's based off of a string. It's on the line type as a string. So we can create an error message, check if the conditions are correct. And of course, we still need to return two values. So we still re return, let's say, zero, but at least the user can test the error. And if there is no problem, we can return the value we want. If we're going to be using this error often, maybe we might want to introduce a constant for this. Remember, this is based off of a string, and we could have string constants, so we could create a constant for this. So let's go back to our error code and introduce a constant for this. So OK, so that seems to work fine. So now we have this. So let's see how we might use this in our code. So of course, now when I go to run my code, you know, I have to also include the additional file that I've created. So there we go. And so you can see uh, where it is. Uh, item cost. Let's see where is that. Oh, 
So let's see. If this is not equal, oh, if this is equals to no error, if it's equals to no error, all right, if equals to no error, then print out the item cost. So there we go. So item cost is $12.99, which we expected. Our error value that we get back is equals to no error, then we know how we got a cost. What about if we pass zero or for item ID or a negative one, for example, what should we expect? Well, if error is not equals to, then we should say item zero does not have a cost. Okay, so something like this. Since we're not using C, we just care about one of the return value and that's the error. So we don't care about the cost, so we use the blank identifier. And notice how we can test for that. Now, the other thing we might want to do is just simply print out the error message that we get or the value of our error code. And as you can see, this is printed out using the, the string method that we attach to our type. Now, this means we can do actually something better with our error messages. We can say, I'm going to test for if item ID is equals to zero and print out that it must be greater than zero, I can also test for if it's less than zero, in other words, negative, and print out a message that's appropriate for that too. And as you can see, we get the different error values that we constructed at runtime, and we can return those. So notice how we're constantly calling error here and passing a string. It would be nice to be able to just create a new error by simply saying, calling like the new function, for example, like this. And here we define a new function that could create an error for us. With that now, it makes creating errors sort of easy if we were to put our errors in its own package. The users doesn't need to see the underlying detail of how the error type is actually defined or created because now they will use this function that just simply takes a string and gets back an error value. And this still works. Well, fortunately, you don't even have to define your own error type and worry about writing the new function because Go provides this for you. Let me move this to a directory out of the way and show you what I mean. I move my error that Go file to this RM directory because I plan to remove it and you can delete it if you like, but we're not gonna compile and use it. And of course I can give it the package RM just to be sure, but I'm not going to be using it, so it doesn't matter. So let's go back to main, I'm gonna close this file. And now I'm going to say that I'm gonna use error type, which I said is already defined in Go, and I'm going to use the errors package to create new errors. Now, since the Go defined the error type already for me, it has a value when you don't assign it, which is nil. And so here I can simply use nil to represent no error. And here, instead of saying no error that like I had before, I just say nil. And let's rerun our code. Now, of course, I no longer have error that Go to worry about. And code works exactly the same way. So, so the only thing that really changed here is that I use the built-in error type and the new function from the errors package. The next thing I wanna show you is this built-in function in Go called defor. Defor is a feature in Go that allows you to defor the execution of a statement until the function returns. So I've called defor on this FMT print line that says leave in main. Now it's at the end of my main program. So it's not gonna really do anything just yet, but let me show you. So I run my code again. And of course, leave in main is the last statement. So in this way, it looks like defor it doesn't really have any effect. But let me show you what happens if I was to move this to the beginning of my function. So notice my defor statement is the first statement in my main function. And let's rerun our code and see what happens. And now notice when it gets called. Like I said, defor allows you to defer calling of the statement that you specified to defor. It must be a function call. Of some form, since I called the for here in main, even though I call it on line 25, it really doesn't get executed until main 
is about to terminate as the very last function in main. So what does this give you? Well, let's do a few examples. It really doesn't matter where I call who, but let's, let's take a look. And you can see, because I call who inside of main and who at a defer statement, well, of course, the defer statement inside of who must be called when who is ending. And since who is called inside of main, well, that means it will be called before any other defer statement in main. Actually, let me move this to the bottom of my function. I'm tired of scrolling all the way to the top. So I'll move it to the end of after main here. Well, notice what I've done here. I've called two to four statements. I've called leaving who and entering who. In which order should this be printed out? Well, let's run it and see. And notice that entering who got printed out before leaving who. The reason for when you have multiple defaults while the last one execute first is imagine that I do allocate a resource, let's say resource A, and I say defer closing or defer cleaning up of resource A. Then I allocate resource B, which depends on resource A. Since allocation of resource B depends on me having resource A, and now I want to also clean up resource B, I can say defer clean up of resource B. At the end of that function, what I'd want my defer statement to do is run in the reverse order, where I clean up the resource B first, then clean up resource A. And that is one reason why if you call multiple defer within the same function, they run in the reverse order. I wanted to introduce you to defer because it's such an important feature in Go, but later on we'll see much more better use cases for it when we get into like section 9 and 10 and so on. Let's talk about closures. Now we haven't really played with closure, but let's write a simple function that demonstrates closure. So I have an anonymous function which I assign to a variable vu. And of course, I can call vu here. And we know what the result is going to be. It simply is going to print hello world. So we see that. OK. But since this is just a variable I have defined, I can certainly move it into a, another function. So for example, so what I've done is I've written another function called return a fun. And its return type is simply a function that takes no parameter and returns nothing. And so, since vu matches that signature, I can certainly return the value vu. So notice I'm calling return a fun, and it's going to return a value. The value it's going to return is a reference to this anonymous function. And now I can call f1, and note that it's also going to print out hello world. Okay, so why am I doing this? Well, if I can return a value of a function from a function, I certainly don't need to define the function outside of the function. I can simply move it within the function like this. I haven't done anything new. Functions, when we assign them to variables, as we said, our first class in they have values and type, and this is the type of it. So this is code is still going to work. Okay, what about if Instead of just my return a function taking no parameter, it actually took a parameter like x, for example. And maybe I wanted to print out that value x within foo. I want to use that value x. Now, what we talked about was scope earlier, and we said that x is a variable within the return a function, and it's valid from the beginning of the open parentheses to the close of, of that parentheses, basically the bounds of that function. So if I'm going to use f within vu, this anonymous function I'm going to return, what is the potential problem there? And so notice the problem is that I'm now returning this anonymous function, which is referencing x. But on line 71, after I call return function, it is already returned, which means x should no longer exist for me to be able to call it or access it when I do reference this anonymous function. But that is not what's going to happen. You're going to see I have no problem accessing the value of x. So let's pass the value 2 here, for example. And now when I run my code, as you can see, not only do I get my hello world, but I get the x that I pass in. So what is happening? Well, to make this easy to understand, and it doesn't matter if x is a parameter or x is actually a local variable,
we can see it still works. So what is happening here? This is the closure. It closes over by referencing or keeping a reference to the value in its enclosing function. If I create another variable, F2, it's going to run and also create a new anonymous function, which closes over those new values that I specified. Now, this is, again, sort of weird and is a contrived example, but later on, we'll see how being able to create closures allows you to do some really, really cool things when we get to like go concurrency, for example, in section eight. So that's it for closure. The last thing I want to cover are packages. So we know that if you want to use a package, let's say, for example, I want to print out some log messages. I can use the standard log package. And so I use the log package to print out some messages. And notice here, I'm using the log package to do some print line statement. So how is this different than using FMT package? So let's run our code and see. And now the time is printed out along with my messages. So this is the idea of login because now you could see what time a message was printed out. And then maybe you can do some correlation between when messages were printed out. But if I want to draw your attention to any sort of message, I have to embed like if it's a warning or info or error or something like that. So ideally, I'll probably do something like this. Right to draw your attention and let you know what is important and what's not important. But all the messages still basically look the same. For that reason, I do not like using the log package that comes standard with Go. Instead, I like using Logros. So where can you find Logros? So let's say you went to godocs.org and you look for Logros. Or you look for any login package and you can see there are a number of them. So here's Logros and I'll copy the link to import this package. And of course, you can click here to see documentation, how to use it. And you can see one way of using it is like this. So I'll go up here and replace this with this. Because remember, when we talk about packages, if I can import this and use it as log ros that whatever, or I can simply override the name with log, and that tells it, well, okay, I want to give this package log ros the alias log and still use it the same way, and I don't have to change my code. Now, it so happens that I've already installed this package, but if you had to install it, you notice you can just type go get and the package name, where, where it's located, the URL, the repository. And so something like this would install that package for you. So now that that's installed, let's run the code again. And notice the difference. So now this is giving me info and some square brackets and some numbers. It doesn't really matter. We can look at the documentation for what this means, but right off the bat, I'm getting some indication of how important these messages are. So I no longer need to encode or embed that information. I can just focus on login. And if I really wanted to log an error message, I should be able to call the error function. I notice now when I rerun my code, not only do I get error or warn, but I also get some colors to draw my attention to what is important and what is sort of concerning. So that's one reason why I like using the log package. Okay, so log package is one thing. Now in lecture 10, your exercise was to install the shared package and its sub package input calc, for example, that I provided so you can do that exercise. So let's take a look. So right now I have that package installed and you could see that it installed three sub packages, calc.a, input, and web. So let's remove that. So I'm going to remove the entire source code. And of course, I want to remove the package installation also. So let's remove that. And if I should rerun it, I should see that there's no such file or directory. So in that exercise, you want to install git that's traversity that Golang shared, let's say. And we know that there are sub packages there. So let's try and install it. And when I try to install it, I see an error that says no files or directory there to install. Well, if you go there, you'll see it all. There are actually subdirectories within this directory. But within this shared directory itself, there are no Go files to install for a shared package. There are sub packages. So I can say I want to install the input sub package. And now when I run that, I have no problem. And if I do ls again, I see that I have input.a. But remember, there are three packages there. What if I want to install all the sub packages? 
So in that case, I can say go get, and instead of having to list each package, I could just use ellipsis to say all the sub packages. And now when I list them, you can see that all three packages were installed. So if you want more information on this, definitely check out the go help import path for more information. And you can also do go help get and that should give you some information on how you can use go get command to install packages. So that's it in terms of the miscellaneous thing you want to cover. I think it's quite a, a bit, but I think it made sense to sort of present them at the end when we had some foundation as opposed to try and include all of it during the other lectures. It would have been quite a bit. Take care. See you in the next lecture. Let's take a look at your lab for section two. So if we go to section two and go down to stub and scroll down to lab, click the readme and you'll see again that I presented the description for the, the lab as a markdown file. And so optional, but if you had installed that markdown preview, you can use that to look at the markdown file. But again, remember it's just a text file. So you really do not need a Markdown preview extension. All right, so let's just go with it. What are you supposed to do for this lab? Write a Golang application, which uses the provided DB package. Now, if you remember in lecture 12, we went through installing several of the shared packages that I provided. So I showed you how to use GoGet to install the shared sub packages there were a couple of them there was calc web input and now there's another one on the section two called db and that's going to allow you to get information about this fictional people's database so you're going to be writing a program that uses this db package and you should look at the documentation for the db package so once you get it check out the documentation and essentially, you're going to be able to get information about people. Where do you get this information from? From a JSON file. So the JSON file is provided in the shared directory on the section 02 database. And you'll find a file there called people.json. So first thing you must do is copy that file to your current project directory. Wherever you're developing your solution, copy that file. Because when you try to use this package it will look for this specific file in your current directory and if you don't you'll get an error message asking you if you've copied the file i'll show you that in a minute what will you do with that information you will calculate the highest income or rather determine who has the highest income who has the lowest income and what is the average income and that is going to be regardless of sex that's in the entire data set who has the highest income who has the lowest income and the average income. Then you will repeat the same thing for women. Then you repeat the same for men. So you will be producing nine data points, three for the entire data set, and then the same three for women and the same three for men. The only requirement is that you must use functions for demonstrating common and reusable code, and you must create at least two packages, including main. So that would be your main package because you're doing an executable and then a package, at least one package for some of this reusable code that you're gonna be developing. Let's take a look at my solution at least. So here I am in my directory to go build. And so it builds successfully. So notice I have a directory called stat. So that's gonna be my stats package and of course my main package. So one common way you'll see go program written is with a CMD direct subdirectory to mean the command. So now we have an executable, we can do this. Notice it's telling me that, oh, I am looking for this people.json file, where is it? So I will copy people.json. So I believe it's in, you go up another directory, share that section 02 database people.json. And I'm gonna copy it here. And now when I rerun my program, you can see that it fetched 668 records and you don't have to worry about this part. This is information that the database package gives you. But in terms of calculating the statistics, you can see there it is, nine data points for everyone, for women, for men.
and if I rerun this again, run it, you can see it's loading different number of um, records each time. So, but that is the idea.